Okay, we're ready to start. Everybody's here. It's 10 o'clock. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, State Assemblyman Jeffrey Dinowitz. Welcome to the Bronx for those of you who are not fortunate enough to live here. I hope you don't mind coming to the Bronx, but we don't want to go to Manhattan. Well, I represent the 81st Assembly District, which happens to be this district, and I'm very pleased to be here because this is my alma mater. Um, I'm also chair of the Assembly Standing Committee on Consumer Affairs and Protection. We're here today to discuss one bill and only one bill. The bill is Assembly Bill A3525A, sponsored by Assembly Member Linda Rosenthal, who's sitting to my right. Let me just put my phone on vibrate before we have a problem. And also with us today are, are from my left to my right, Assembly Member Dee Dee Barrett, Michael Samanowitz, Dennis Gabrzak, Linda Rosenthal, James Skoufis, and David Buckwald. And we have a few more coming. I'd like to welcome everybody to this hearing to examine uh, the impact of possible state labeling requirement for foods containing gen genetically modified organisms or GMOs as proposed in 3525A and the effects that the bill would have should it become law. In recent years, a consumer's ability to know if the food he or she eats contains GMOs has become an increasingly contentious issue. Consumer and food advocates argue that a labeling requirement would, require, would provide consumers with a better understanding of the foods they purchase. Retail, agricultural, and biotechnology advocates contend that such labeling requirements would be unnecessary, costly, and perhaps unlawful. Recently, the Vermont House of Representatives passed legislation that would require foods containing GMOs to be labeled, but the Vermont State Senate has not acted on similar legislation. Connecticut and Maine have also passed labeling legislation, but both states contain conditional effective dates, namely that other states must enact similar legislation before their laws would take effect. At a Consumer Affairs and Protection Committee meeting on June 3rd, this bill, 3525A, uh, was brought before the committee, but it did not have enough votes to be reported by the committee, nor was it defeated in the committee. The bill will come up again in the future. In light of the growing demand for labeling foods containing GMOs, as well as interest from Consumer Affairs Committee members and other Assembly members, we have come together today to hear testimony from advocates and interest groups who are either for or against labeling. In addition, we look forward to receiving written testimony from anyone interested in participating in the process, and we ask that you submit such written testimony within one week from today, August 6th. Now, for the sake of time and to leave time for questions afterwards, I'm going to ask the witnesses Please do not read your testimony. We're all capable up here of reading. Please summarize your testimony. Get your major points across. We have very strict time requirements, and I'm going to enforce them. We've asked each uh, witness to limit their testimony to five minutes. In five minutes, you can say a lot, and then there will be questions from members of the committee. Uh, each witness will be sworn, and your testimony is being recorded. In addition, I ask that the audience be silent at all times. I know that there are many enthusiastic people here on either side of the issue, but uh, any kind of noise or outburst or cheering or booing or whatever or signage, uh, that's only going to delay the hearing and any kind of stuff like that will come out of the time of whatever side the particular person is on. So please, let's just listen to the testimony. We really want to get information here. The members uh, here, most of whom are on the Consumer Affairs Committee, uh, very much want to get as much information as possible so when the time comes that the bill comes before the committee again, uh, everybody can make an intelligent decision as to how to proceed. And with that, I will call the first witness, and that is Michael Hansen, Ph.D., Senior Scientist from Consumers Union. Okay, would you raise your hand, please? Do you swear that any testimony you will give will be the truth? Yes, I do. Okay, please state your name and then proceed. Yes, um, my name's Michael Hansen. I'm a senior scientist at Consumers Union. That's the policy and advocacy arm of uh, Consumers Reports. And we're headquarters in Yonkers, New um, York. And I want to thank you. I'm here to testify uh, in support of A3525A, a bill that would require labeling of 
uh, foods that have been derived from genetically engineered ingredients. As I will discuss in my testimony, unlike other developed countries, the U.S. does not require genetically engineered foods to be proven safe before they can go on the market despite significant safety concerns. But even if all reasonable safety testing has, uh, were required, certain individuals could still have um, unusual uh, allergic or other adverse health uh, responses that would not be detected beforehand. There could also be unexpected effects, just as there sometimes are with pharmaceutical products, despite extensive pre-market testing. For all these reasons, it's important to label uh, genetically engineered foods so negative effects can be uh, noticed and identified, and so consumers who simply want to avoid these new foods can do so if they wish. And the points I'd like to make is there's global agreement that genetic engineering is different than conventional breeding, and that there should be uh, required safety assessments uh, before these products come on the market. The human safety problems that could arise from GE are the introduction of new allergens or increased levels of naturally occurring allergens, change levels of plant toxins and changes uh, in nutrition. There can also be unintended effects. There's been global agreement through Codex Alimentarius, that's the food standards setting organization of the UN. They've done a number of topics on this. The US is alone among all uh, developed countries. We do not admit that genetic engineering is different than conventional breeding. Our policy, uh, which was put out in 1992, was promulgated by then Vice President Dan Quayle. Uh, it was as a deregulatory uh, initiative. So the FDA says uh, genetic engineering is an extension of conventional breeding. There's no required safety assessment. There's only these safety consultations where the companies make their own decisions. I would point out that in 2001, the FDA also put out a policy statement that admitted that genetic engineering is different than conventional breeding and does raise safety issues, yet the FDA is still regulating GE under the 92 policy. In June of last year, the, uh, the American Medical Association's House of Delegates, they changed their position to one where now they support mandatory pre-market safety assessment. As they said, quote, our AMA supports mandatory pre-market systematic safety assessments of engineered foods. Uh, I'd like to say there's also uh, evidence of health problems. The FDA is poised to approve a genetically engineered salmon that's been engineered to reach market weight in half the time of wild salmon. However, the company's own data suggests there could be allergy problems. Uh, a problem with these safety assessments that are done on engineered plants is there's uh, very few long-term feeding studies are usually 90 days or shorter. There was a carefully designed over a meta-analysis of 19 published feeding studies that uh, looked at animals eating GE corn or soy, and they found damage in the kidney, liver, and bone marrow, which could uh, be potential indicators of onset of chronic diseases. However, no animal tests are obligatory for GMOs cultivated on a large scale. Last October, there was a long-term two-year feeding study that found that GE corn caused tumors and premature death. The study by Dr. Eric Giles, Seralini, and colleagues was viciously attacked in the media by pro-GE and industry-affiliated scientists in what appears to have been an orchestrated campaign. What wasn't said is that the French Food Safety Agency and the European Food Safety Authority have functionally agreed with Dr. Seralini that such long-term safety assessments must be done. In fact, on June 28th, the European Commission announced that they were spending 3 million, 3 million euros to fund a two-year cancer uh, study on the same GE corn variety, NK603, that Dr. Seralini and his colleagues used. I then finally would like to say that in addition, we have no independent safety testing of these crops in the U.S. because of intellectual property rights concerns. When farmers buy these crops, they have to sign a product stewardship agreement which forbids them from giving such seeds to uh, researchers. In 2009, 26 public sector scientists took the unprecedented step of writing to the EPA and they protested that, quote, as a result of restricted access, no truly independent research can legally be conducted on many critical questions regarding the technology, end quote. That led the editors of Scientific American to publish a perspective that stated, quote, we also believe food safety and environmental protection depend on making plant products available to regular scientific scrutiny. Agricultural technology companies should therefore immediately remove the restriction on research from their end user agreements. Uh, we concur and believe that only truly independent safety tests can give us answers about the safety of GE foods. In the meantime, it's crucial that these engineered foods be labeled so if people experience any negative uh, 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 effects, they and their doctors can identify them. So in sum, 
because of these safety concerns raised by the long-term feeding studies, because of the allergy issues, and because consumers have a right to know what they are eating, CU supports labeling of engineered foods. Finally, at least 62 countries, which together include more than half the world's population, including all the European Union, China, India, Japan, Korea, Australia, Russia, Brazil, and South Africa, require labeling of engineered foods. And finally, a number of polls from 1995 to 2011 have found between 70% and 95% of uh, Americans' polls support mandatory labeling. The New York Times came out with their poll that was at 95. Such labeling is important because consumers have a right to choose the foods they eat and to avoid any unintended health effects. At the bottom line, CU supports mandatory labeling of uh, GE foods and so strongly supports A3525A. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <clears throat> that, that hum was for the people about to applaud. Thank you very much, Dr. Hansen. Um, question, uh, a couple of questions, and my colleagues might have a few questions as well. Uh, the, w one of the issues which has been brought to our attention with respect to this bill is whether or not constitutionally we can do this. Um, th there's, there's been legislation with respect to other areas that have been stricken uh, that uh, I guess the claim is that there's federal preemption on this issue. Uh, for example, uh, the case International Dairy Food Association v. Uh, Amstoy was stricken uh, in 1996, which uh, had a labeling requirement mm -hmm. on, uh, with respect to milk. Uh, do you have any opinion as to whether or not uh, this legislation would pass constitutional muster? Uh, yes, I do believe it would pass constitutional muster. If you look at the, uh, that particular case, the IDFA versus Amstoy, I know it very well because it was some of our testimony that helped uh, get that bill passed in um, Vermont. And that was a bill that would require labeling of milk and dairy products from cows that have been treated with RBGH. And what the problem with the, that bill is the state didn't say it had any state interest. It said there was mere consumer curiosity. They would not admit that there could be, a, a, for example, an unintended health consequence. If there's an unintended health consequence, that's a compelling state interest. And I would also point out that uh, that decision was in 97. In 2010, there was the 6th District Court um, outside of Cincinnati because in the state of Ohio, they had tried to say, you can't label milk as RBGH free. And the state indeed, uh, on appeal, the court ruled that yes, milk from treated cows is different and that labeling is valid. So I think uh, that shows there's not a problem. And I would also point out what is preempted at the federal level is ingredient labeling. So that's why this bill and the other bills that have been heard in other states are very clear not to say this is ingredient labeling. Uh, this is just the process of, uh, of whether genetic engineering has been used. And so the FDA, they formally don't have a position on genetic engineering, so they can't really uh, preempt these kinds of labeling. So you're saying that uh, the FDA has, has neither said uh, genetically engineered foods is bad or good. They simply haven't taken sides yet. Well, what they did is in 1992, they said it's an extension of conventional breeding. Therefore, we're going to treat it the same under the law. But then what they did in 2001, is with this pre-market biotech notification, they actually uh, put out a statement saying genetic engineering is different because of this insertion of mutagenesis. They would want data on each separate transformational event. But they're continuing to regulate under the 92 policy, not the 2001 policy. And I would argue that the 2001 policy is them admitting that they got it wrong in 1992. And again, globally, there's an agreement that genetic engineering is different. And the reason that's important for Codex is because that's functionally written into the WTO agreements. Uh, I'm sure you read the article, the front page article in Sunday's Times uh, on the potential destruction of the Florida orange crop. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I thought that was an interesting article, although what upset me about it is it didn't talk about any alternatives. That citrus greening uh, disease is being vectored or it's a bacteria, and what's causing it to infect the citrus trees, it's a little insect called the a Asian uh, citrus psyllid. And it turns out that that insect 
uh, normally comes from Asia. They found a parasitic wasp that perfectly controls this disease in the Reunion Islands and in Puerto Rico. There have been releases in Florida. They haven't worked that well yet, but that's because they think that uh, there's a genetic strain of uh, parasitoid that maybe that's the problem. But, but the bottom line is there's a biological, uh, biological control that is working that more money could be looked at, and that's not mentioned at all in the article. That is that, that there's another way to treat that, that same problem. It has cured the problem, as I said, in other countries, and there could be further work done here. So that, and there was actually the week before this article on how we need engineered potatoes, and the problem with that article is it didn't mention these other agroecological techniques to get to the same endpoint. So and, that's and the, my and response. And the release of those wasps screening. in in that in other locations hasn't caused any other unintended consequences. No, in in fact, the scientists that have been doing some of the uh, releases here, Dr. Dr. Marjorie Hoy and colleagues, she's a good scientist at the University of Florida. She actually did some of the first work on genetically engineered uh, spider mites. So they're looking for these um, methods, and I have a review article from last year about the. Uh, the greening disease and how uh, many places do think these uh, parasitoids and uh, natural enemies are useful in the management of the insect that vectors the disease. Mm. And so when you're spraying all the time, you're killing all those natural enemies. So we need to pay attention to some of that natural e e ecology because with the greening, we don't know whether that's going to work down the road. They've spent millions on it, and yet there are these wasps that have worked in other countries. If only some of that same money could be um, go into finding the right strain, we could probably get it to work here as well. Okay. Um, I, I should point out, by the way, that w while while a local city council, I think, has hearings on every bill before it, they don't really have many bills before it. Uh, we have thousands of bills, so it's not typically the case that we hold a hearing on a specific bill. Uh, but some bills obviously merit uh, a, a detailed discussion, and, and that's what we're doing here today. And the sponsor of the bill, she's not on the committee, but she is the sponsor of the bill. I want to give her first the opportunity to ask some questions, and then we'll go to the other members here if they have any questions. Uh, Assembly Member Rosenthal. Thank you, Assemblymember Dinowitz, first of all, for convening this hearing. As you, as you just said, we have a lot of bills in, in the Assembly, and most of them do not get a hearing, but you know, I'm happy, and I know the audience is happy, that you've decided to convene this just to discuss this one important bill, because it is something that we all need a lot of education about, and there are so many experts out there from both sides, um, and I'm, I'm honored to be invited to be here on the panel. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Hansen, I know you've been traveling for years around, around the world basically testifying and providing your expert opinion on GMOs and GMO labeling. Can you tell us some more about um, your assertion that independent research can't be done on these genetically engineered crops and that researchers have to get permission from the companies before doing any of the research? Uh, yeah, that's actually, uh, that's one of the huge problems. Since these are, um, since these have utility patents, the companies control them. So any research you want to do with them, there is an agreement that you have to come to with the uh, company. That's why, you know, when farmers buy the seed, it says in their technology agreement, they can't even give the seed to researchers. The only way the researcher can get it is they have to go to the uh, company. And I should have brought it here with me, but just last week there was an article in the, uh, in, it was the Connecticut News Junkie, and it was about labeling and um, what's happening in uh, Connecticut and all the states in the uh, Northeast. And the Monsanto spokesperson there said these are the hev most heavily tested products, but they said because they are patented, there are no independent safety tests. And that's that's what the uh, real problem is. I said, you know, that's why uh, all those scientists wrote to the EPA. And that's why, if you look at it, most of the independent uh, safety testing that is being uh, done, they, they've all been studies that have been done outside the 
um, U.S. Because I can actually give you examples. I know scientists here in um, New York City, for example, uh, who did work showing that BT, that the endotoxin flows out of the roots of the plant and can actually adversely affect uh, soil organisms. So they found it for one Monsanto variety, and when uh, Dr. Sosky went back and said, I would like to test it on these other uh, varieties, Monsanto said, sorry, we don't agree with your research, so we're not going to give you access. So he had to stop that work and move to something else. So that's a real problem because uh, the way I put it is, where would we be today if the tobacco companies got to control what kind of research gets done? That should be unacceptable, particularly for health and safety. Any scientist should be able to take these uh, foods and do whatever they want with them in terms of scientific uh, justification. And that's why I think there's a real problem, because we need independent So in the, in the absence of those kinds of tests, um, your opinion on labeling as a second yes, best? Yes, we label it, and that's this, the global language that was gotten through uh, Codex is labeling serves as a risk management measure to deal with scientific uncertainty. And the scientific uncertainty, there's uncertainty in the genetic engineering process itself. You have no control over where you're inserting things, so you can disrupt stuff and cause all sorts of uh, uh, problems. So it's unknown what the health consequences should be. That's why you label, because if something shows up down the road, that's the only way you can attract it. Because none of us are saying that these foods are, uh, are unsafe enough that people are going to be dropping over you know, and acutely dying tomorrow. It's the long-term effects. So that's why you have to have uh, labeling to be able to track that. And um, just if you would briefly say, what is the, um, the, in all the other countries that do demand labeling, how do they, how do they deal with that? Well, the, uh, there's actually different forms of labeling in the different countries. Uh, so, for example, the European Union, they require uh, everything to be labeled. Uh, if there's more than nine-tenths of a percent of any ingredient is engineered, that fact has to be on the um, label. They also require labeling even if you can't detect any engineered protein or DNA. And what that means is uh, oil from uh, engineered canola or engineered soybeans would have to be labeled. Sugar from engineered sugar beets has to be labeled. So that's one form. That's how Europe and China does it. Other countries like Japan and Australia, they say you test, uh, if you can detect uh, this transgenic material, you test, and then they have various thresholds, 1% or 2%. So it uh, varies like that. And then some countries label it on the ingredient on the back. Others. For example, uh, Brazil has a triangle with a T in it that um, stands for transgenico. So there's uh, different uh, labeling schemes in different countries. And, and do companies like Monsanto um, work over there to try to you know, get rid of these labeling requirements, or have they conceded the battle in those countries? Well, what's actually interesting is when the European Union required labeling over 10 years ago, Monsanto actually took out uh, advertisements in both the uh, French and in the United Kingdom saying that they supported labeling, that there was going to be this new labeling regime coming in and, and that they supported it. And so in happened? terms of working against it, the way that happens is uh, it's the U.S. that hasn't uh, supported uh, labeling, so the pressure would come on, you know, bilateral agreements and that way. So that's how the companies would be working on that front. But why did they say 10 years ago they supported labeling abroad? I mean, I guess we uh, because can ask... the public in Europe wanted that, frankly. Uh -huh. I mean, okay. that's, that's why we have now, there's 64 countries around the world that require labeling, and new ones come in every year. And Just this year, for example, India is the newest country. They, their labeling started in January. And the fact that the FDA has basically sat on the sidelines is, seems to me, is actually aiding and abetting the anti-labeling um, push by those companies. Well, I think what the big problem is is, you know, it's 20 years uh, later, and we, we have global agreement. Genetic engineering is different than conventional uh, breeding. There should be required safety assessments. U.S. cannot meet that standard. We can't meet the global standard. The U.S. knows it. Behind closed doors, they admit that. So we have to get some kind of safety assessment. And until we get that, we have to have labeling. 
Now, the engineered animals that might be on the market, like the salmon, they're going to require data, but the first data package is very poor with that one. So, so I mean, it seems that the state-by-state state, uh, mandatory labeling uh, laws is the way to go in the absence of FDA. Yes, in the absence of the FDA taking it, I think states have to take strong action because that's often how you get federal action, is action will be taken in a few states and then it often moves, moves to the uh, federal level. So when the federal government won't take action, it's up to the states to lead. And this has happened before. New York and California and other states have led before, and they, I think they need to lead again. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Assemblymember Gabrizak. Thank you. Um, just a couple questions relative to the FDA. Uh, FDA labeling right now uh, of products, is that that's done or controlled by the FDA? Um, some labeling is, but others, uh, for example, if you want to put uh, New York, uh, say your cheese is uh, New York cheese, you don't have to well, get I'm that. Well, I'm talking approved. about the ingredients, you know. If yes, you FDA, right FDA now, that, controls ingredient labeling. Okay, so that, that is controlled by the FDA yes. uh, throughout the nation. That's correct. Do states individually have the opportunity to, uh, or are there any states currently that add to that federally approved labeling? Um, we have the state of Alaska uh, passed a mandatory labeling bill for any fish that are engineered would have to be labeled in Alaska. That was passed a few years ago and has not been challenged as being unconstitutional. So there is a mandatory labeling law in one of the states that's been enacted. It just hasn't come into force because there haven't, the, this engineered fish still hasn't been approved yet. One of the things I can uh, agree with you with is the fact that there still needs to be um, additional testing in, in terms of uh, determining uh, what's good or what's bad about, uh, about GMOs. Uh, I do agree with that. Um, you, you've stated that under the independent safety testing that a company can deny uh, a research scientist or, or someone from uh, getting the, the, the seed or the crop and, and doing independent testing on that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, whether it's safety testing or environmental testing. That's, that's why those scientists wrote to the EPA. Because, for example, if, if a scientist wants to, con uh, wants to compare Monsanto's BT corn rootworm variety right next to Syngenta's, they can't do it. That's why they complained to the agency, and there have been some changes, but no, there is not this independence, and that's the big problem. Is there any testing that is done by the FDA on these products? No. But there is none? No. The FDA doesn't get samples, doesn't get seed, they don't pro provide any type of testing before? Uh, that seed goes is sold or product goes to market? Nope. They, there's the only thing they do is these voluntary safety consultations, and that's like a, a shadow play because if you look at the letter that, that goes to the agency, that the agency sends to the company afterwards, there's no conclusion. I mean, here's the sentence, for example, that was uh, sent to Monsanto in their letter on September 25, 1996, and it was about Mon 10, the first BT corn variety. And I'm going to read you this sentence, and then this sentence is actually in all 97 consultation letters. Quote, based on the safety and nutritional assessment you have conducted, it is our understanding that Monsanto has concluded that corn, grain, and forage derived from the new variety are not materially different in composition, safety, or other relevant parameters from corn, grain, and forage currently on the market, and that they do not raise issues that would would require pre-market review or approval by FDA, end quote. So the FDA is very clear. They make no conclusions about the safety. They could have put a sentence in their letter saying, we agree with this analysis, but they say nothing. And I think the reason for that is their lawyers know this is not a safety assessment. So if something goes wrong down the road, these companies don't have any liability protection. So the FDA sets up no requirement as far as uh, None whatsoever. GMOs. That's why we're saying there should be not only required safety assessment, but then you can start to talk about the protocols of what kinds of tests should actually be, be done. So anything that the companies are doing, it's they get to decide themselves. And we don't think that that is not the proper way. 
anything that we put into our food, we should not, it should not be up to companies independently to determine whether that's fine or not. That has to be made by an independent authority such as the FDA. So, based on, on what you just said, FDA... Try to control yourself, please. Uh, based on what you just said, the FDA does, does no testing uh, of GMOs before it, before it goes in. That's correct. Uh, the FDA website says FDA regularly uh, regulates the safety of foods and food products from plant sources, including food from genetically engineered plants. Uh, foods from genetically engineered plants must meet the same requirements, including safety requirements, as foods from traditionally uh, uh, bred plants. Right. And also evaluating the safety of food from a genetically engineered plant is a comprehensive process that includes several steps. Uh, but th th this is coming from... from I know, own. but notice they don't make any conclusion, and they say they have to meet the same requirements as any conventionally bred food. And you can put a new variety of tomato or anything you want on the market and not do any safety testing at all. There's no requirement. So when they say that these are these, uh, that all these tests are being done, they're, they're not being evaluated by the FDA. The FDA, they don't make a conclusion about any of this. They do more work for a color you want to add to a food or any tiny food additive. Before you can put that into a, a food, it has to meet the, the legal criteria is reasonable certainty of no harm. That's all we're asking for these engineered things. And whatever the FDA says there, they don't make any conclusion. They don't require anything. All they say is the companies do a bunch of these tests and they think this is fine. And that's not, we wouldn't allow that with food additives. We wouldn't allow it with uh, colorings. <coughs> Why are we allowing it with GE when everybody in the world agrees that it's different? And once it's different and it raises safety issues, then you test it and you label it. Being from Consumer Reports, I think this, this will also be my last question now. Uh, being from Consumer Reports in, in, terms of, in terms of the labeling, uh, is there a recommendation that you would have? Is it something that would just be included? In the current uh, label, it, w well, what, what would you say would be appropriate in, in terms of what kind of labeling do you, the labeling do you want would be or should different, be on a product? Right. It, if it were done at the federal level versus at the state level, because as I said, at the federal level, uh, they control ingredient labeling. So th this could not be uh, required that ingredients all have to be uh, labeled. That might be a better way to uh, go, but that's why all these bills, what they do is they require that if a genetically, uh, if there's any uh, genetically modified organisms or parts of any genetically engineered products in there, that statement has to be on a label. And you can, if it's going to be on the front or the back, that's all, it's all up to what people uh, want to do. Uh, we would just like to see at the uh, state level just the fact that it's engineered should be somewhere on the uh, label because that's the first step for being able to track any uh, problems. If we were talking about a national bill, then um, I might talk about uh, what kind of ingredient labeling should be done. But, that, but that's not what's okay. under discussion. Here. I'm sorry, that just prompted one question when you, when you talked about leaving it to individual states for labeling. If you had individual states that pass whatever type of requirement uh, for labeling, uh, be it an additional set-aside label or include, I don't know if, if you'd be able to include it in, in, the, uh, in the label that, that's uh, ingredient label that, that's on products right now. If that was to be done, what would the impact be upon the industry that produces these products to in terms of production or whatever they have oh, to do? Uh, yeah, the to... problem with the various states. Well, all I can say is what's being done there. I've testified so far in all the states in the uh, uh, Northeast where, the bill, where bills have um, um, moved through. We've worked, and so has Center for Food Safety and others, has tried to make sure that the legal language in all those is functionally the same. 
And that's also true with the ballot uh, initiative out in Washington State. So the idea on all these things is to make them as easy to implement as possible, to make all the state ones be basically the same thing so that you don't have this patchwork of uh, quilt and one state wants a 1% you know, threshold and another state wants 5% in another state. That would create a, a nightmare. But if everyone is trying to do the same thing, then I don't see where the problem is, because if you can label it for one state, you can label it for others. Thank you. Assemblymember Samanowitz. Uh, two, two, two real quick questions. Number one, if you know of non-organically labeled products, what, what percentage of products in the, in the market are, contain GMOs? Um, for the non-label, uh, the, uh, the percentage that would be engineered is, it should be pointed out for soybeans, 94% uh, of the acreage is engineered. Corn, 88% of the U.S. acreage is uh, engineered. Corn and soy are in about 75 to 80% of all processed food products. So that's what you're, uh, so, so is it that's safe roughly to assume what that you're talking about. If I walk into a about. grocery store and I'm not buying organic, that the product that I'm buying had contains some. If sort it's of GMO. processed food and it contains corn or soy, yes, it probably has it. But in terms of whole things, the only other whole foods that are out there is about uh, as of 2006, there were 11 percent of uh, zucchini acreage, and then from Hawaii, we've got some papayas. But other than that, there's not much that would be either fresh fruits so, or vegetables. So pure, purely from a marketing standpoint, wouldn't it make sense to label foods that it's GMO free? Well, um, no, it actually, that's being, you both have organic and there's the uh, non-GMO project and they have 5,000 or 6,000 products now uh, labeled. The uh, problem with that, that's fine and, you know, that's a, a market advantage, but if you're talking about a potential unintended health consequence because of there wasn't proper safety assessments, you want to know who was exposed. So that means you want to know, that's why you have to have a, a mandatory label because if something doesn't have a label on it, it could contain an engineered ingredient or it couldn't. The way you have to track those problems to do proper epidemiology is you need to know who is exposed, and that's why you have to have a label. It's, it's to track any unintended health consequence, either positive or a negative, that could uh, pop up. That's why uh, having the market work and just have this voluntary labeling, you know, GE-free labeling, that's fine if the market wants to do that, but that doesn't help you with the tracking of a, of a potential safety concern. And, and are there any other states, and they may not be able to, but are there any states that, that deal with or regulate the safety standards for GMOs? That, that, that legislate testing or? No. No. Thank you. Uh, Assembly Member Barrett. Um, thank you. Um, I, you know, I appreciate what you're saying about unintended consequences, but I represent a district with a lot of small and mid-sized family farms in the Hudson Valley, and um, you know, in this really tough economic times, it's been one of the great success stories that agriculture and small family farms are coming back. Young farmers are literally putting down roots in the area. Um, and I'm concerned about what the ramifications, the unintended consequences to some of these farms. When you said just earlier that, you know, 90 percent of, of soy already is uh, genetically modified, I mean, what's available? I hear from farmers that even as much as they'd like to be um, feeding their animals uh, feed without GMOs, that it's not even available for them. So what do we what do we do about that? How do we address that? Well, yes, they're without actually putting these farms under. Yeah, uh, there is increased market demand for um, non-engineered feed. But I should point out that your farmers that are concerned that they're feeding their cattle engineered corn or soy, this labeling doesn't apply to them because this is only uh, labeling for foods that are uh, engineered. So an animal that is eaten and engineered. Uh, corn or soy, that animal isn't engineered any more than you're engineered because you've eaten corn or soy. So that doesn't get labeled. So they would not be required no. to be to label. No. I see. No. Okay. The only re uh, way they would be required to be labeled is if and when they decide to approve a genetically engineered fish or a pig or a cow or an animal. But no, just feeding. Uh, just feeding feed to those animals does not make them genetically engineered. Otherwise, we'd all be genetically engineered. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, Assemblymember Scoopus. Thanks for your testimony. And uh, before I ask my one or two questions, let me just uh, say that I voted for this in committee, this bill, but I had a lot of reservations and I was looking forward to this public hearing. Um, you mentioned a lot of things in your testimony that, that don't pertain to this bill, though. You mentioned what the FDA did and didn't do. Um, this bill is not about who can do research on the seeds, which I think you know, scientists should be able to do the research on the seeds. But that, that's not what this bill addresses. Um, the, uh, the health risks of genetically mod modified food, this doesn't address, this, this, isn't, this doesn't conduct a study into the health risks of, of GMOs. This just has to do with labeling. So I, I want right. to focus on that. And uh, my first question is um, the 1992 FDA decision, um, what, what went into that decision? Did they do studies? Did they uh, do any kind of research in coming to the conclusion that there was no substantive difference between genetically modified foods and uh, traditional foods? No, there was actually a lot of debate within the agency and the policy that came out looked remarkably virtually identical to one that had been drafted for the International Food Biotech Council a couple years before in uh, 1990. In fact, uh, if you look internally, the head of the Center for Veterinary Medicine at the time, Gerald Guest, actually wrote a letter to the FDA saying, uh, since animals um, could be eating, if corn or soy is engineered, that's the main thing in their diet. They actually uh, the Center for uh, Veterinary um, Medicine said that there should be required safety assessments of these foods before they go on the market, and they weren't listened to. There were other scientists within the agency that said genetic engineering is different. It could raise all these problems, but they were overruled at the top, uh, and it was decided that there wasn't any a difference. This was a policy that came out of the Council on Competitiveness in the White House and it was introduced by then Vice President Dan Quayle as a deregulatory initiative at a biotechnology industry organization gathering on May 29, 1992. Okay. So, so on the opposite side, are there any studies that have shown that there are significant or really any health risks from genetically modified foods? Yes, there's, there, are. Uh, there are quite a range of them. Um, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, okay. studies that that have been done uh, from anywhere from allergenicity to adverse reproductive effects to effects on the gut. These are very carefully well-designed studies and those can all be uh, uh, presented. The reason I mentioned health effects is that's the reason why you label. Labeling, as, as I said, serves as a risk management measure to deal with scientific uncertainty. That's clearly the case here. And so that's why I would argue we have to label these foods so that we can track Well, the reason why I asked those two questions was, isn't it FDA policy already that if they're uh, in, in a genetically modified food, that if there is um, uh, something that's introduced that causes a new allergy, doesn't that already have to be labeled? Isn't that FDA policy already? Uh, no. What the FDA policy is, is if any of eight uh, what are they call the eight major allergens, if they've been moved into something, yes. But if uh, something has increased the uh, level of a known endogenous allergen, no, that doesn't require anything. And I would point out there is, uh, as I've uh, submitted in testimony elsewhere, there is a um, study where they looked at MON810, and it's near Isoline. They were grown in a growth chamber, so it's exactly the same in environment. Well, it, it turned out th that the MON810 it had a gene turned on in it that was gamma zine. That's a known corn allergen. So we have an example of a known allergen in corn was turned off in the wild type and turned on in the engineered one. Okay. So that, yes, uh, there's many studies. I can submit them to you. There have been review articles that have pointed out these uh, 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 problems, and they're linked in my uh, testimony. Look at the footnotes, and you can link to the, to the studies themselves. Okay, just one last question, and to continue what uh, Assemblyman Samanowitz said, um, you know, when I walk into a grocery store, typically, you know, when I go shopping, there's an organic section, and then there's the rest of the supermarket. Um, and in response to this question, you, you said that, you know, labeling will help affirmatively determine what the person was exposed to, um, should there be some kind of health problem. Um, take me through that process. You know, a person goes to the doctor, the doctor says, uh, you know, what did you eat? And we want to see, you know, how it affected the problem that you have right now. You know, short of someone keeping a journal about what 
they ate and keeping the labels or whatever it might be. You know, how, how does labeling help along that process? Well, it's the same way we do epidemiology now anyway. Uh, so, for example, if, say you're allergic to kiwi fruits, your industry has uh, 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 brought this up. The first time you find that out is, say you're eating a fruit salad and you have this reaction. What the doctor does is you have to recall all the food you ate in the last 24 hours. You exclude those and then you bring them in one at a time, right? Now let's say somebody has taken the gene for kiwi fruit and they put it in a tomato and you eat a pizza and have an adverse reaction uh, later. You can remember everything you ate. Once you bring each of those foods back into the diet, if you bring the tomato in and it's not the engineered one, you're not going to respond to it. So that's a way, if it's labeled, where you can possibly uh, figure it out. Not always, but at least you have a chance of uh, doing that. And that's how these food recalls happen. It's the same thing when there's an outbreak of some uh, disease and they're trying to figure out, uh, is it linked to tomatoes? Is it linked to peppers? That's epidemiology. You go and you ask people that have got sick, what have you been eating? Thank you. Assembly Member Buckwald. Uh, thank you, Chairman Dinowitz, and thank you for having this hearing. Um, and my thanks as well to the sponsor of the bill, who I know uh, has helped in putting together the hearing as well. The, uh, Dr. Hansen, thank you very much for your testimony. Sure. Uh, if a product is labeled organic, can a consumer automatically conclude that it's GMO free? Uh, they can conclude that um, engineered materials uh, have not. Uh, are not supposed to knowingly be used in it. Could there be some contamination? Could there be some level of uh, GE in organic? The answer to that is yes. Given that, do you think that the legislation before us should include a blanket exception for organically produced foods? Well, uh, yes, because um, GE cannot be used as part of uh, organic, just like there's an exception in here that says if a farmer doesn't knowingly uh, use them, say they buy seed that's, certi that's uh, certified as conventional uh, soybeans or conventional corn, somebody could test that and maybe there's one in a thousand, one in ten thousand trace contamination. Well, that's not what the farmer in, uh, intended or, uh, or uh, knew about. That's why that's exempted. So, yes, I do think there should be an organic should exemption. Should we have a, an exception for any product produced by a farmer who doesn't knowingly produce, have genetically modified components? Uh, that's already in there. Well, what, I guess what I'm saying is um, the why if, have both an organic exception and that knowing exception. If, if the reason for the organic exception is because they don't know, why, why well, have no. that? Uh, what the both? difference is, is the organic, there's already legislation about what organic is and it very clearly says genetic engineering cannot be part of organic. That was clearly done, so there's already regulatory history for that. That's why they decided if we're going to do a legislation, that's already carved out for the organic portion. Now, for a conventional farmer, if they're buying conventional seed and they don't knowingly use it, then that would put them uh, functionally, I guess, in the same – well, it isn't in the same category because with organic, you're forbidden from using those engineered ones. A, a conventional farmer, you're not. It's it, if, if you choose not to do it, then – and you can show, look, I bought non-engineered seed. Then if they end up being contaminated, that's inadvertent and you're not responsible. And, and Dr. Hanson, are there any genetically modified foods that you consider safe? Well, I will put it this way. There I have been none that I've seen that have gone through a full safety assessment, so I don't know. They could all be safe or they could not be. You don't know until – you do the studies. And so building on that, you mentioned the New York Times article this past Sunday on the effects of a genetically modified orange resistant to citrus screening bacterial infections. Um, the article lays out a three-step testing regimen for this new type of orange. Uh, first, that the EPA conducts, conducts animal tests to assess the safety of the protein produced by the new gene. 
Second, that there's a test of the protein as it appears in the pollen of the transgenic orange blossoms. And third, that the juice is tested to compare safety and nutritional content to conven conventional uh, uh, oranges. And you've, you've stated that the U.S. does not require safety testing for genetically engineered plants. I said the oh. FDA doesn't. What you're talking about that case is that's um, EPA doing that because that engineered um, gene that they would put in there, they would consider that as a pesticide, as a sort of plant pest, and it's under the EPA uh, guidelines, the plant pests themselves would have to be uh, looked at. So they would look at the protein, since that would be considered a pesticide. That would be the EPA looking at that. They would not look at, for example, unintended consequences, the fact that the genetic engineering could have turned on toxins or changed other characteristics. That's not under their purview. Um, and that's something that, again, globally there's been uh, an agreement that unintended effects should all be uh, looked for. That's not what EPA does. They only would narrowly look for that, as they said, that bacterial uh, trait. And if you read it, it wouldn't even be the one that was produced in the plant. They were going to let them produce it in uh, bacteria for their feeding studies. Um, and so that's EPA testing. That's not FDA. And uh, FDA is the one that's uh, responsible for the full food safety assessment. So they should be looking at the unintended effects as well. And this would not do that. So in your written testimony, uh, which you submitted to the committee, where you, uh, you write, uh, uh, unlike in other developed countries, the U.S. does not require genetically engineered foods to be proven safe before they can go onto the market, uh, despite significant safety concerns. That's you correct. You're saying there are times that genetically engineered foods are tested by the U.S. government, but they're not tested for safety, that at least all the elements of safety that uh, you believe. Uh, yes. When we're safety. talking about food safety, uh, if you want to get into uh, detail, the EPA does look, uh, for example, at the BT crops. They have done safety assessments for the actual protein that was engineered in. Now, our criticism of that is, is those safety tests have been done with the BT protein that is produced by a, a, an engineered bacteria, not that is produced by the plant itself. That is the only thing that the EPA does. So if there have been safety assessments, they have been not for the food, but just for that one component of it. And that's not a complete safety assessment. Yes. Those parts have been done, and we have criticized each of the BT uh, assessments because they're not using uh, the BT that occurs in the plant. They're using a as, bacterial. As laid version. out in the article about the oranges, it's, it appears to me from there that they are eventually at some of these steps testing the plant, but am I re reading that incorrectly? Uh, the EPA is testing, and then when they say they'll look at the various juice components, that's part of what uh, the companies call substantial uh, equivalence. They can look at a range of that, but again, there, for that orange, there would be no requirement for the FDA, for example, to say, we, th we have looked at this and we think this is safe. What would happen is the that company will, will get a letter just like the one I read you, and there will be a sentence in there that will say that it is their understanding that whoever did that uh, orange has concluded that the orange and the products derived from it are not materially different. In the FDA would not make a conclusion about the safety, and that's mm -hmm. the difference. We're asking for the FDA, like they would for a food additive, to evaluate something to see if it meets the legal criterion of reasonable certainty of no harm. That doesn't happen at this point. That would not, uh, the discussion in the Sunday Times, that still would not happen. Little portions of that, there might be people that look at the various differences in parts of the juice, but that's not where my safety concern would be. So just to summarize, is, am I correct to understand that in this particular case, and it might not be applicable to all cases because not all uh, genetically modified foods are modified in the same way and are subject to EPA testing, but in this particular case, the EPA tests and essentially um, determines the safety of the particular protein that is being produced, but not necessarily, but there isn't necessarily comprehensive testing of the food overall. That's correct. That's exactly correct. Although, again, the problem would be the protein that they're testing for is not the one that occurs in the plant. 
The one that occurs in the plant is actually different because it has sugar groups and all these other things on it. I would say that the science advisory panel to EPA has told them this over and over again, that, that, that you should be using the protein that occurs in the plant. But they do not do that. We have said that they should do that. Their own scientific advisory panel has said they should do that, and they don't. So, yes, there is some safety assessment from EPA, but it is inadequate in my view. Isn't step two, as laid out in the article, testing of the protein as it appears in the pollen of the transgenic? That, and blossom? that is a good thing, because that would actually get the pollen as, as it appears. And yes, looking at feeding that pollen to see whether it can uh, disrupt pollinators or other things, that's ecotoxicology, that's wonderful. And yes, that should be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Hansen. Thank you. Our next witnesses will be... Uh, that time will come out of the next pro witness. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, huh? Um, the next witnesses will be Jeff Williams, Eric Ohms, and Beth Chittenden. Thank you. Okay, would each of you raise your hands? Do you swear that your testimony will be the truth? Okay, each of you please state your name and then I'll just take you individually. Name? Beth Chittenden. Eric Holmes. And Jeff Williams. Okay, uh, so we have a panel of three. Uh, you will each have your very own five minutes um, in whichever order you decide you'd like to testify. All right, I'll take the lead, thank you uh, for letting us appear today. My name is Jeff Williams, and I work with New York Farm Bureau. I'm the manager of government relations. And uh, the three of us would like to give the agricultural aspect, the agricultural benefit, the side of the, of the story. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm not going to interrupt you more than one. Sure. You're talking about of labeling now, of, not of GMOs, of labeling itself. Biotechnology and labeling, yes. Uh-huh. Okay, because the bill is on labeling. Okay, mm -hmm. go on. First of all, I'll talk about the agricultural industry, which uh, is very large. Uh, we're fourth in dairy in the nation, second in grapes, third in apples, and top ten for vegetables. Uh, we ship uh, in New York, we ship uh, across the country, and we ship overseas. Uh, we have a very vibrant feed grain industry. Uh, we supply feed to our growing dairy industry, corn for two ethanol plants, and soybeans for export markets to China. Uh, there's also a biodiesel bill that you all passed uh, for bioheat that we're hoping, hoping the governor will sign, which will hopefully increase soybean production in New York. Uh, it's already increased 31 percent since 2009, and we've, uh, the corn industry has uh, increased by 2.6 million bushels since 2010. About 80 percent of corn and soybean in, this, in the state are produced uh, through biotechnology. And biotechnology is very important to the farm industry it increases crop production, reduces pesticides, uh, and petrol, uh, diesel use on farms because you don't have to sp uh, spread as much pesticide, uh, so you're not in the tractor as long. Uh, so that can equal three to five pesticide applications a season. And just as po point of interest, about 10 years ago, we were dealing with this issue, a uh, similar biotech issue, and it, we, the farm industry was moving away from pesticides towards biotechnology not just because of the increase in yield, but the decrease in pesticides. Consumers were saying they did not want uh, pesticides uh, sprayed as much on their foods. And so they moved and transitioned to biotechnology, and here we are again. Uh, this is going to be particularly important because we need to double food production in the world by 2050, uh, and we need to do that not just in America, but teach developing countries how to do that as well. And biotechnology is playing a large part in increasing yields, uh, drought-resistant corn uh, and helping uh, disease, uh, fighting disease in fruit and vegetables. We defend upon our federal government for the safety of what we do. Farmers are not in the business of putting out uh, low-quality food. The USDA, uh, EPA, and uh, FDA 
are all at the federal government studying and overseeing the process. The USDA decides if it's safe to grow, EPA decides if it's safe for the environment, and the FDA, uh, through the consultation process, decides if it's safe to eat. The USDA has said there's no significant difference between foods produced using bioengineering and their conventional counterparts. There's been many studies, uh, including by the National Academies of Science, United Nations, uh, World Health Organization, have said that they support biotechnology. As far as the labeling goes, uh, we are uh, in opposition to state labeling of foods. Uh, it's going to increase costs, as you probably heard, uh, will hear later on today as well. Uh, in California, when they were looking at the, the Proposition 37, it was uh, determined that it increased about $400 per family, uh, the lab a labeling mandate. Uh, which may be fine for some higher income people, but low income people uh, simply cannot afford to pay that much money. Uh, and Oregon's labeling, labeling proposal is estimated to cost taxpayers about $20 million. And what was talked about by the first speaker, it was a very good discussion, uh, but and some of the members of the panel brought this up as well, that we already have a labeling process in the state. You can buy non-GMO or organic food. Uh, it's readily apparent that if those labels are on there that it is uh, GMO free uh, and the consumer can decide right now. Uh, basically, uh, beyond the agricultural benefits, the environmental benefits cannot be denied. Uh, we're talking about reducing greenhouse, greenhouse gases by virtue of biotechnology because of low-till or no-till farming that biotechnology al allows us. Uh, reducing greenhouse gases about six, equally in about 6.3 million cars in a year. Uh, so there are sizable environmental benefits uh, as well. Uh, and so that's sort of an overview of, our, of the agricultural side, agricultural testimony. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. My name is Eric Holmes. Uh, my father, two brothers, and I are partners in a 450 cow dairy farm in Kinderhook. In fact, I milk my cows this morning as I do most mornings. In addition to our cows, we grow all the corn and grass that our cows will require, as well as some to sell to neighbor farms. I also have uh, my own kids and several nieces and nephews that we hope to integrate into our farm. As for the hearing today, biotechnology is not a new idea, and agricultural biotechnology is simply a new name for continued improvements in the tools used to breed better varieties of crops. Consumers have been the beneficiaries of biotechnology for many years. Biotechnology has given diabetics a safe, reliable, and consistent supply of insulin since the early 1900s. Biotechnology has also given cheese manufacturers an effective and efficient means of obtaining rennet, a food enzyme utilized to curdle milk for cheese. Much of the cheese in New York is produced using biotechnology. <clears throat> biotechnology products that farmers use in New York are BT and Roundup Ready corn and Roundup Ready soybeans. BT, BT corn is utilized to control European corn borer and, and other things, and it's a product that I've used on my farm. Like all farmers, I take very seriously the quality of milk and crops I produce to help feed our ever-growing population. That's why I support USDA, EPA, and FDA, who are charged with protecting our food supply and safety of our environment. And I'll just say this, after listening to the first person testify this morning, I would encourage you to have someone from FDA come in, because I've always been led to believe, I know he said that the salmon in Alaska has a um, requirement to be labeled, but it's not on the market. Why isn't it on the market? I would likely say it's because it's being held up by FDA or EPA. Um, FDA has consistently stated there's no significant difference between food produced using bioengineering as a class and their conventional counterparts. <clears throat> New York Farm Bureau is a grassroots organization that supports the rights of organic farmers to grow and market their crops and fill this market, just like we support the ability of farms to make their own marketing decisions in regard to the usage of biotechnology. That said, I do not agree with legislation that would label food produced using biotechnology, especially given scientific evidence that I just stated. Labeling legislation would mislead consumers, as USDA has declared, increase the food of cost for consumers in a failing economy. This all seems a bit unnecessary when I can walk into my grocery store and buy foods already labeled certified organic or non-GMO. We already have a labeling system in New York. This leads me to a question. If we did have labeling in New York, how would it be enforced? Who would inspect the food production's process label claims? How do you ensure the integrity of the system for food production and GMO labeling? 
I'll just say I talked with a number of my fellow dairy farmers last week about this very issue. And our big question is, a lot of people are using it. If you see a label and it's not backed up by, a fe by the federal government or the state government, that label is only as good as the person you're buying it from. So if you know your farmer, if you're going to a farmer's market and you trust that farmer, you can trust that label. Otherwise, what good is the label? Thank you for your attention to my testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Good morning. My name is Beth Chittenden. Um, I'm from Columbia County, New York, Dutch Hollow Farm. My family and I farm um, 2,200 acres and milk 600 cows. It's a three-generation family farm with 16 members ranging in age from 70 to 1. Um, we grow 90% of the feed for our animals, which are dairy cows, which includes GMO corn and GMO soybeans. Biotechnology-derived crops reduce the use of chemicals, prevent insect damage to the crops, and improve the amount of feed grown per acre. Through GMO crops, we can improve conservation methods by less tillage, preventing erosion. We can target specific fields and areas for insect problems rather than having to use widespread chemicals. Use of Roundup Ready products has decreased the number of trips over the field to spray herbicide and cultivate the crop. Eliminating the need of cultivation has decreased erosion on our farm. This allows for better conservation methods and preserving the soil that we farm and use every day. GMO corn is resistant to insects like European corn borer and rootworm, allowing us to grow healthier stands of corn and higher yields without the use of insecticides. We have not used insecticides on our farm for over 10 years. Also, using GMO crops allows us to target the crops predatory insects. So we're only targeting the insects that are affecting the corn and the soybeans, not all of the insects in the environment. Since adapting the BT corn, we have um, increased yields and um, improved our conservation methods and um, have been able to do it for the last 10 years. Soybean and corn that has been genetically modified is more resistant to drought and adverse weather conditions, as we've seen in the last few years. This helps ensure that every seed that we plant in the ground is going to yield a crop. Um, to grow one acre of corn costs $500. If we don't harvest a crop because rootworm or um, the weather is bad and takes out that crop, it is devastating for all farmers. Furthermore, through a slight change in the DNA, the cell walls of the corn are not as rigid, allowing animals to digest more of the plant. This allows more nutrients for the animals per acre grown. I am opposed to legislation that would require special labels for food and beverages that contain ingredients derived from biotechnology or genetically engineered crops. There is no scientific basis to justify mandatory labeling. It is solely on the basis of genetic hearing theory. Regardless of the intent of pro-labeling advocates, mandatory labeling of biotechnology-derived food would likely confuse and scare consumers. It would provide no health or safety benefits and would have significant negative effects on agricultural productivity, resource use efficiency, weather risk management, farmer profitability, and the environmental protection gains made possible by the adaption of biotechnology. That does not even include the cost that would be so much higher to purchase food. Current law provides for a science-based regulatory program for agriculture biotechnology products coordinated by government agencies, including the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the EPA, and FDA. In the United States, we have almost 20 years of experience in the use of biotechnology-derived crops for human and animal food without a single adverse incident. The F the FDA has declared these ingredients 
to be of no material difference to conventionally produced ingredients and therefore does not require special labeling. They have stated that the labeling of products to indicate the presence of genetically engineered ingredients would be inherently misleading to consumers. Just a second. This is a hearing. The only people who should be talking are the witnesses and the members of the assembly. This is not a hearing for you to express your point of view here. You're welcome to submit testimony. I made an announcement at the beginning, and I can assure you that I'm taking the time out of other people. We have 14 witnesses, and I, for one, don't intend to be here till midnight. Now, if you can't control yourself, please go outside. Thank you. Sorry, go on. Okay. The World Health Organization, Food and Agriculture Org Organization of the United Nations, and many other independent scientific bodies have evaluated the safety of products of modern biotechnology, including ingredients derived from them, and have concluded that they are as safe as their conventional counterparts. Any change to our nation's food laws should be based upon credible scientific evidence and there is none that supports the labeling requirement. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Thank you. Um, I do have a few questions. The, the purpose of the hearing, as I've said a few times, is really focused on the labeling requirement, not on whether GMOs are good or bad. Uh, I have my own opinions, but that's not what I'm here to express today. I want to focus on the labeling requirements that would be put forth in this bill should it become law. We have a lot of, if when you go and buy food, there are a lot of things on the labels right now. Now maybe some of them are federally mandated, uh, but there's a lot of information on foods, calories, carbohydrates, sugar, so on and so forth. The specific ingredients, whether it's kosher whether uh, it's, it's the, the deposit and take case of, of soda and uh, carbonated beverages. And I believe that in that case, it's done on a state-by-state -state basis. My question is, uh, you've indicated that it would raise the costs to label. Could you explain how that would happen, that it would raise the costs? Um, because New York in a few very small northeast states would have a boutique label, essentially other states wouldn't have to do that, so manufacturers would have to increase the cost for spending that much money labeling in a very small area of the country. But why would that increase costs? Because they'd have different production lines or different times for production. I mean, I, I can tell you, and I'm, I'm not trying to be argumentative, but I'm just trying to understand this. Uh, a few years ago, when we were uh, debating changes in the uh, bottle deposit law, uh, one of the arguments that was made to us against having the deposit at all it was because it was that uh, it would require different states to have different labels because some states have deposit laws some don't uh, I mean if you look at a can of soda I think it indicates um, it, it I think it indicates some states that have the deposit law but the point is the argument at that point was that we shouldn't have deposit laws because it increases costs, and there was an overriding reason to have uh, the bottle deposits that seem to be, to most people, to be more important than whether uh, there may or may not have been an increase in costs. But so, if this bill became law, and it became the law in other states, I think two words, if I if I read the bill correctly, would have to be added to a label. It would just say genetically engineered. Am I correct? That's what the bill does. So. How many letters is that? Maybe 20 letters, maybe? No, I'm serious now. How would that increase costs? Well, I'll, I'll, I, I can let the grocery manufacturers talk about that more uh, specifically, but it okay. seems to me that you're, they're going to have to purchase enough product for new boxes of Betty Crocker cake fix, and they're going to have to print a box just for New York State and Connecticut. And they're not going to have to print it for Michigan or Texas, and so they're going to have to have a whole other paradigm, a whole other scheme for printing those special boxes. Well, I mean, I, I, I go shopping and I look at labels. I, very, I really look at labels. And, you know, in, in, in some products you can have different labels 
for the, for the same product depending upon where you buy them. Sometimes you see uh, some of the information in two languages, for example. Sometimes you don't. Uh, and there, there are other differences, I think, that you would find for the same product in a different location depending upon the circumstances. And I, I'm, I'm just having a little trouble understanding how having a different label, a different label, would have a, any kind of real impact on the costs. First of all, who's going to guarantee that the, the food is labeled correctly? Who's going to do all of that sampling? Where's it going to come from? That is going to increase the cost to have somebody test it to see if it's genetically engineered or not before you can even put it on the label. If there is no testing done, the labeling really is not effective. Well, tell me if you disagree. I think it's more likely somebody would omit the words genetically engineered if, if food product contains genetically engineered um, food as opposed to a manufacturer putting the words genetically engineered on the product if it weren't genetically engineered. Why would they do that? They're trying to, it's marketing. People are simply trying, people might do it to get a marketing niche. So, so, Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Shh, please. I just, I just want to understand this. It's been argued to me that the mere words genetically engineered have a negative connotation. If that's the case, why would any manufacturer use those words if the product weren't genetically engineered? Again, I can't, I'm not going to speak for the manufacturers. My impression would be they would over-label in order to remove themselves from liability of having a product that doesn't have, that has GMO product ingredients in it, when it, when it's labeled that it, it doesn't. I see. Okay. Um, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, who's the sponsor of the bill, Assemblymember Rosenthal. Thank you. Um, Mr. Williams, welcome to the Bronx. Does organic food cost more than non-organic food? By and large, yes. Okay, so in your testimony you said that you were concerned that um, consumers will be hard hit because they'll have to pay more for food that's, uh, that needs to be labeled because labeling will, will ca cause the cost of GMO uh, food to rise. So you said they can buy organic if they don't want GMO, but organic costs more. Mm -hmm. So that seems to contradict um, your stated wish to keep lowered costs for, for purchasers. I, that testimony is written on behalf of a consumer who doesn't really have a, a valid, or not valid, who doesn't have a desire to purchase non-GMO food. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure the, most of the people in this audience would per, prefer to pay less and know if there's GMO in their food. I, so I, they I, don't have that option I, if it's only organic or non-labeled. I, I respect that, but there's 18 million other people in this city who may not have that same intent or desire. Well, if you, if you heard or read about the recent New York Times uh, poll, and this is of, of the country, uh, I forget, it's like 90%, 95% of people wish to see labeling. I mean, why, why do you discount um, those kind of numbers? We, we have always, uh, we have organic members of, of, our industry, of our association. We have always looked for marketing niches. Every farm looks for a marketing niche. But we also, what we try to do as an organization is educate consumers as well. And because I think we have a very you know, strong story to tell about, about New York agriculture and American agriculture. Our job here today is to try to educate consumers, I mean, rightly or wrongly, about why we don't think labeling is, is needed. If they don't agree with us, that's fine. Uh, but sometimes... But why know, is an education as in this product has a GMO organisms in there and this doesn't, why is that not part of the education? Why is that not important for education of consumers, that's particularly because that's what they want? Well, that, well, that's important to, perhaps to you, 
but it's not, but it's, it's equally important to farmers to make, to, to, to educate people and consumers about the fact that there's food that they grow, whether conventionally or through biotechnology or organic, is also safe as well. There's two different stories to tell. Okay, safe has different meanings, especially Absolutely. if there's no concrete proof that all of these GMO products are safe because of some of the Monsanto keeping proprietary uh, information. Now, you know that labels change all the time. For example, when um, companies introduce a new product in New York, they put new on the label. Then when they change it a bit, they put improved. Sometimes they make it light, L-I-T-E. And they do this, they don't have the same marketing strategy in every state. They have different ones to appeal to different consumers. So they make those changes all the time. Why do you contend that putting GMO on a, or GMO free or GMO on labels in New York State would amount to such a huge cost when part of the marketing strategy is to change labels frequently? I'm going to let the grocery manufacturers specifically answer that question because I don't have all yeah. right, but you did but, say but, that. But, it costs but, but what I do want to say about labeling is, is given the science behind biotechnology, farmers who choose to use biotechnology don't want to be tainted by some kind they of... They don't want to be what? Tainted by... But why is it tainted? A, per, a perception that their, what their food is is not high-quality food or safety. Well, why, why is it tainted? Why does it say GMO in this product is tainted. Why is that tainted? Unfortunately, there's a lot of misleading information out there. The farmers haven't been able to tell their story. And um, the perception from the public is that anything GMO or bioengineered bio is tainted. And if we had to grow more of those types of food in New York State, there would be less production, which would then raise the cost of food to everybody. And the seeds are not available. So there would be a lot less food grown in New York State if you wanted, if most people wanted GMO-free foods. Where do you get your seeds from? Um, we buy them from several different companies. It doesn't make a difference. Um, Is Monsanto all very one of them? Do I have to answer? Is Monsanto? Yes. yes. As long, along with many others. Many others? I mean, Monsanto has bought up most of the seed companies in this country. So what other ones are there? Essentially, Monsanto and DuPont, and then you've got maybe some regional brands. Okay. Um, the reality is, uh, one thing I did agree with the first witness on is he said 94% of the soybeans and 88% of the corn grown in this country uh -huh. are genetically modified. Uh -huh. That's a fact. We started doing this so we could limit the pesticide applications. And everybody said, that's good. And now but we're isn't it true that a higher use of pesticide is now necessitated? No. Absolutely no? Not. Well, that's not, that's not what I understand. Uh, that, yeah. you know, there are more and more uh, crops resistant to um, well, I'm not, the Roundup? I'm, I'm not about to... Um, there are crops that are... There are vegetable crops that are grown in, in, in certain members' districts here. I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus where they have to spray multiple times a week. We grow our corn one time we spray, that's it. Uh -huh. One time. One and time? What do you spray it with? We spray it with Roundup to kill the weeds. And you can buy Roundup in any uh, home and garden center. I can also not buy Roundup, but that's if correct. your seeds are all from Monsanto, I need to know about that. And, and you, uh, Ms. Chittenden, seem to disparage consumers ability to understand labeling, to understand science. What you said before is that labeling would confuse consumers. I would like an explanation for that. Absolutely, because as I said before, um, I've seen a lot of publications that are not science-based against GMOs, and they don't understand, just like you're saying, that Roundup Ready is bad. You know, there's no um, chemicals or pesticides inside Roundup Ready seeds. It is basically taking a, a plant that had a DNA that was resistant to Roundup mm -hmm. and taking the DNA and putting it in corn and soybean so that when we spray that crop with Roundup, the corn doesn't die, and neither do the soybeans, but everything else in the field, all the other weeds do. 
So basically, there is less pesticides, insecticides, and herbicides that we have to use. We, with BT corn, we have not sprayed any insecticides because no longer will rootworms and corn borer eat the roots of our plants. If we did not plant that, our plants would be susceptible to those. And people don't understand the fact that if they're susceptible to those pests, they're going to die. And we won't have a crop. And if we don't have a crop, your food price is going to increase. Well, I just would like to say on behalf of myself and all my constituents who are consumers and have contacted me, they want to know. Um, they can, they're perfectly capable of reading labels um, and of understanding um, what a label would say. And I, I find it, um, I don't know, reprehensible is too strong a word, but I really find it objectionable that the quest for more information is frowned upon, and I think that's because you're afraid of what we're going to find out. Absolutely not. I open my doors of my farm. Okay, the... Absolutely not. I open the doors of my farm to the public every day. Uh -huh. I want to teach them and let them know. Um, I guess I would look at it in the case of uh, doctors and lawyers all each have their specific jobs and they know very well how to do their jobs. As farmers, we know very specifically how to do our job as well. And come to us and ask us questions rather than making assumptions about the food that we're growing. We will be happy to open our doors and explain what we do for you. Okay, uh, one last thing. In a 2009 study by Doug Gurian Sherman, a senior scientist with the Union of Concerned Scientists, they looked at four Monsanto seeds. Um, and they found also that in 49% of surveyed farmers reported Roundup resistant weeds on their farms, up from 34% the year before. And this problem has costed farmers more than $1 billion annually. <clears throat> Chemical giants like Monsanto and Dow are developing crops capable of withstanding even harsher pesticides resulting in an endless cycle of greater pesticide use at commensurate financial and environmental cost. Do you have a comment on that? That's, that's um, interesting, and I'd be happy to look into what you have. If you provide me with it, I'll give you a response at a later time. Uh, that's not what we've experienced on, on our farm. And, uh, but again, please forward that information on, and we'll be happy to look at it. Okay, thank you. Just one quick question. Uh, you mentioned one of, I would venture to say, the, the bigger issues you have with, with this bill is that um, it's New York specific and it would require uh, New York specific labels. Um, would you be, you know, given that, would you be supportive or do you have any thoughts on if this were a national bill? Would, you be, would Farm Bureau be supportive of that? Um, I can tell you from a New York perspective, at least we're all dealing on the same playing field. And then we all, and I would theoretically, a national, if the national bill had some teeth behind it to actually ensure that the label was good, um, it's something we definitely look at. Oh, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, since most of the discussion of this bill has been at the, about the consumer retail effect, there's one aspect of this bill I want to ask uh, you, the representatives of the New York State Farm Bureau, and that is that one part of this bill um, that hasn't gotten much attention is the fact that it requires the labeling of seeds and seed stock, pres presumably provided to farmers uh, that are uh, genetically engineered. If this bill were limited to requiring the labeling of seeds and seed stock, what would the position of the New York Farm Bureau be? It's already labeled. I, we don't buy anything that we don't already know. I, I, you could add another label to seed and seed stock, but I mean, I don't know. For everything that we purchase, we are already aware of it. Yes. Everything, everything is labeled. It, it is genetically modified. All the seeds that we purchase. Th thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. 
Okay, next we have Laura Height, Senior Environmental Associate, NYPIRG, and Johanna Dyer, Attorney, Natural Resources Defense Council. Good morning. Do you swear that your testimony will be the truth? Always. Uh, please state both of your names individually. Uh, my name is Laura Height with the New York Public Interest Research Group. I'm Johanna Dyer with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Okay. Maybe you should move the microphones a little bit closer to you. Okay. How's that? Um, shall I start? I'm sure. Okay. Um, good morning. Uh, first, I want to thank, uh, thank you and the committee members for holding this important public hearing. And in particular, committee members travel from quite a distance uh, to, to make it here, so that's, uh, that's much appreciated. Um, NYPIRG is New York's largest consumer government, re government reform and environmental advocacy organization. And we have a, a long history of advocating for labeling and right-to-know laws uh, for both consumer products and services. Issues we've worked on include uh, irradiated food disclosure, RBGH labeling, item pricing and unit pricing for supermarkets, insurance product disclosures, consumer credit card disclosures, and ATM fees. However, I'm sitting here not as our consumer advocate, but as our environmental advocate. Uh, NYPIRC developed its position on GMOs in 2000 as an outgrowth of our work on pesticides, which is the issue that I work on. At that time, which is only a few years after the first, first large-scale commercial harvest, which was in 1996, genetically engineered crops already covered a quarter of U.S. farmland. So NYPIRC joined forces with a coalition of groups in New York calling for a five-year moratorium on planting these genetically engineered crops in New York so that the potential human health and environmental risks of GMOs could be adequately studied. We also supported at that time the labeling of products containing GMOs. Can you hear me okay? I don't know why my voice is wobbly. But I'm going to get a little bit more comfortable. I the audience for the moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, two bills were introduced in the state legislature around that time addressing these issues. Unfortunately, until now, neither has seen the light of day. Uh, the moratorium bill was introduced in 2000 by then Assemblymember Jack McEnany and Senator Ken Laval. And the labeling bill, uh, which we're looking at today, uh, was initially introduced in 2001 by then Assemblymember Tom DiNapoli and Senator Laval. Year after year, these bills have languished in, the, in the, the Agriculture Committee and the Consumer Protection Committees of both houses, respectively. So this year's vote in the Assembly Consumer Affairs Committee on the labeling bill, A3525A, is actually the first time uh, that the state legislature has taken up this issue. And to our knowledge, this is the first public hearing that's been held on it since these bills were first uh, introduced around, around the year 2000. Our concerns about these new technologies have proven well-founded. Uh, the planting of GMO crops in the U.S. has grown at an astonishing speed. Uh, we've already talked about 94 percent soy, corn, 88 percent, cotton, 96 percent. So these are really the dominant uh, agricultural practices for these crops. And uh, contrary to the statement made by Jeff Williams of the Farm Bureau, um, we actually can deny the environmental benefits of, of, of these products. We have retrospective studies which have shown a tremendous increase in pesticide use uh, as a result of the Roundup Ready uh, herbicide tolerant uh, GMO crops that are being used. Um, predicted um, estimated 404 million aggregate increase in pesticide use as a result of GMO crops. And that takes, a, takes account for the fact that there has been a decrease in pesticide use because of the BT GMO crops. Um, as predicted, we've witnessed the emergence and rapid spread of super weeds, which are resistant to glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in, uh, in Roundup, causing farmers to use additional pesticides to control them. So to tackle this problem, the biotech industry is now developing new GMO crops that can tolerate herbicides such as 2,4-D, leading to an ever-spiraling increase in dependence on pesticides. And they're also using other pesticides on top of the, the Roundup to try to address these weeds. This is the opposite direction that our nation's agriculture should be heading in. Integrated pest management techniques have proven to be far more effective and utilize far less harmful pesticides. And real briefly, it's in our testimony, but these pesticides are quite dangerous. We talk about, you hear the biotech industry talking about glyph glyphosate being benign, but it can cause a wide variety of health risks. This is primarily in the agricultural production. Uh, there are trace, uh, traces found in, in, in foods, but uh, we've, many studies have shown exposure to glyphosate can cause um, uh, childhood cancers, increased premature births and miscarriages, birth defects, particularly brain and skull malformation, 
uh, now with this new generation using 2,4-D, um, that's the ingredient that was linked to Agent Orange used in Vietnam, and it ha that's been linked to many can cancers as well. And the pesticide production benefits achieved so far with the transgenic corn and other crops using the Bt will soon be erased by the evolution of insect populations resistant to Bt. Uh, for instance, there has been an emergence of a Bt-resistant corn rootworm, and that's causing pesticide companies now to recommend the use of corn soil insecticides, which is exactly why they're, that, that renders completely uh, um, unnecessary. That, I mean, the initial point of when they were marketing these Bt crops is, oh, you won't have to use these, these, these soil insecticides, and now they're saying, oh, by the way, you know, you're going to have to. Um, and in China, there was an example um, back in 2004 where Bt cotton crops experienced a significant infestation of, of, a, of a bug called a myrid, uh, which causing the farmers to spray 15 to 20 times more pesticides on their Bt cotton crops than the non-Bt cotton crops. But it gets worse because that infestation spread to their fruit products, to grapes, apples, peaches, and pears, escalating the pesticide usage in other agricultural sectors. So to go back to the labeling issue, um, you know, aside from the concerns raised about the potential health risks from consuming GMO products, there are many reasons why consumers may prefer to avoid purchasing these foods. Some people have religious or ethical concerns about the whole concept of transferring a gene from one life form to another, from, for instance, a, a plant species to an animal species or vice versa. Um, uh, some people have concerns about the idea that seed saving, which is a practice that's been you know, utilized by farmers since the dawn of agriculture is now illegal because uh, uh, Monsanto has patented this, this technology. Um, there are also very significant ecological impacts, as we address in greater length in our written testimony, um, including the uh, potential genetically modified foods. Not just potential, it's been proven to cross-pollinate with, with native plants and non-GMO crops. The right to meaningful information is a cornerstone of modern consumer protection law. President John F. Kennedy, in his special message to the Congress on protecting the consumer interest in 1962, declared that the federal government has a responsibility to consumers in the exercise of their rights. These include the rights to safety, the right to be informed, the right to choose, and the right to be heard. Unfortunately, in the case of genetically engineered foods, the federal government has failed to meet its responsibilities to America's consumers. It is now up to states like New York to step up to the plate and ensure that consumers' rights are protected. NYPERG applauds Assemblymember Linda Rosenthal for sponsoring this important legislation requiring manufacturers to label their foods when they contain GMOs. This will provide New Yorkers with the knowledge they need to make informed consumer choices when they go grocery shopping. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. More or less, okay. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Johanna Dyer, and I'm an attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council, also known as NRDC, which is a national environmental and public health organization that, as you may know, has been actively in engaged on environmental issues in New York for more than 40 years. For many years at the national level, and more recently in New York, NRDC has directly worked on food and agriculture issues. In fact, NRDC is now partnering with many groups around New York to strengthen our sustainable regional food supply. We're very happy to be here today to offer a brief preliminary statement in support of A3525A, a bill sponsored by Assemblymember Linda Rosenthal, uh, that requires the labeling of genetically engineered foods and agricultural products. We support this legislation for the simple reason that consumers should be able to know what is in their food and make informed decisions about what products to select and which growing practices to support. Labeling food that has been genetically modified would send a message to chemical corporations that are perpetuating the growing and unsustainable use of toxic pesticides. In recent years, agricultural businesses have increased their use of crops that have been genetically modified to survive lethal doses of herbicides that would kill nearly any other kind of plant. This genetic modification has also resulted, um, as, my colleague, uh, as my colleague has mentioned, in increased herbicide use and the growth of herbicide-resistant superweeds. And the next generation of genetically modified crops looks to be even more harmful, with the potential to unleash wide-scale use of older and more toxic herbicides, such as 2,4-D, which, as we mentioned, was a component of Agent Orange, and Dicamba, and replacing millions of acres of genetically modified crops 
um, genetically modified corn and soy already engineered to tolerate herbicides, pesticides, and insecticides with these new crops that are designed to withstand the applica application of even more toxic chemicals will truly be a disaster for public health and the environment. NRDC is not categorically opposed to genetically engineered foods, but we do strongly support increased transparency in our food supply so that consumers may make informed decisions about the food they purchase. And we believe that this proposed labeling legislation can serve as an indicator of our society's willingness to examine and address the problems inherent in our industrial food system. In short, allowing consumers to make educated decisions about the food products they consume and the growing practices they choose to support is one step toward a sustainable food system. Thank you for the opportunity to present our testimony today, and we look forward to working with you in the coming year to enact this important legislation. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, for your testimony this morning. Uh, the Whole Foods supermarket chain has announced that effective as of, excuse me, the uh, Whole Foods supermarket chain has announced that effective as of 2018, they will require all products sold in their stores to be labeled as having genetically modified components or being GMO free. Do you, either of you have any sense as to why Whole Foods supermarket is waiting until 2018 to implement that requirement? Uh, I don't. <laughs> Perhaps one of the later speakers will know, and we can try to get that answer for you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Why do you think the um, the previous panel was so vehemently against uh, labeling, when it is on on just the plainest level a consumer right to know? Um, and I know you both have worked on this um, on this issue, and you've encountered this opposition. What do you think is the real reason that they're so opposed to it, aside from consumer confusion, which I don't believe? I want to have full disclosure here and say I have a real soft spot for farmers. I love farmers, and my family actually, uh, I, I descended from farmers, so uh, I don't want to say anything to impugn anyone's motives. Um, farmers, I feel, have been in, put in a tough spot here because that's pretty much all they're being sold. I mean, the reason why we have this, almost all of, uh, of our farms are in these GE crops is because that's what's being sold. Um, so I, I think any, any fear about labeling that might be tied to, for instance, the public rejecting those products might be directly tied, and again, I, I can't speak for other people's motives, to fear that their own livelihood will be impacted if, if their products can't be sold. So I mean, I, I think, you know, going back to a sustainable agricultural system that we need, and we need to have more investment, not in this biotech stuff, but in integrated pest management and, and more support for farmers, uh, both to support, support them to, to transition to conventional, to, to organic practices, but I think we also need to support conventional farmers who don't want to use uh, GMO seeds. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Louis Finkel, Executive Vice President, Government Affairs for Grocery Manufacturers Association, and Michael Rosen, Senior Vice President, Food Industry Alliance of New York State. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Raise your hand, please. Do you swear that your testimony will be the truth? I do. Please state your name and your affiliation. Louis Finkel, uh, Executive Vice President of Government Affairs for the Grocery Manufacturers Association. Michael Rosen, Food Industry Alliance of New York State. Okay. Um, some people are having a little trouble hearing, so my advice is that everybody should be quiet, and you should put your uh, microphone a little bit closer to you. And be loud? Uh, well, be loud, but not too loud. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Thank you again. My name is Louis Finkel. I serve as Executive Vice President for Government Affairs of the Grocery Manufacturers Association, the Washington, D.C.-based voice of more than 300 leading food, beverage, and consumer products companies. On behalf of GMA, I would like to take this opportunity to register our opposition to A3525A and the concept of mandated labeling of genetically modified foods and beverage products. GMA and its member companies are committed to providing consumers with the safest possible products 
and food and beverages containing ingredients derived from genetically engineered plants are safe. It is also why we supported enactment of the Food Safety Modernization Act three years ago, the most sweeping reform of our nation's food safety laws in more than 70 years. Accordingly, we believe that this legislation is deeply flawed as it would impose a mandatory label that suggests food products derived from biotechnology are potentially unsafe for consumption. Such a label would be inherently misleading as there is overwhelming agreement among regulatory and scientific bodies in the U.S. and around the world that these products are in fact safe and without nutritional distinction. Ensuring the safety of our products and maintaining the confidence of consumers is the single most important goal of our industry. Genetic engineering technology simply adds desirable natural traits to a plant without introducing anything unnatural or using chemicals so that crops may go quicker and more plentiful. Further, genetic engineering is not new. It has been in use for more than 20 years. Today, food and, and ingredients derived from genetically engineered plants make up 70 to 80 percent of the foods we eat every day because they require fewer pesticides, less water, and keep, the, and keep production costs down, reducing cost to consumers by 20 to 30 percent. In addition, genetically modified foods and ingredients are also used to help feed the hungry and malnourished in developing nations around the world. GMA supports the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's existing science-based labeling policy with respect to foods and food ingredients derived from modern biotechnology. We believe that the FDA policy provides a comprehensive framework for consumer protection and choice and clearly serves the public interest. That framework and approach is also supported by global scientific bodies and, and regulatory agencies, including the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Medical Association who agree that food and beverages that contain ingredients derived from genetically engineered plants are safe and that the in these ingredients are materially no different from those derived from conventional plants. All foods, whether or not they are produced using biotechnology, are regulated by the FDA for their individual safety, toxicity, and presence of allergens. It should be noted that genetic m modification is a process and not an ingredient. Like selective breeding and other uh, agricultural techniques, including planting, harvesting, and even irrigation methods, the, bi the biotechnology that is subject to this legislation is merely a process. Special mandatory labeling imposed above and beyond the FDA, <laughs> F FDA currently, cur what FDA currently requires could mi mislead consumers into believing that foods produced through modern biotechnology are somehow different or present a special risk or a potential risk, even though FDA and other scientific bodies have studied these foods and determined them to be safe and nutritious. In addition to safety, providing consumer choice is a core value of our industry. If this legislation is intended to address consumer choice, I would argue that those choices already exist. Individuals who make a personal decision not to consume foods containing ingredients derived from genetically engineered plants can easily avoid such products simply by purchasing products that are certified organic. Consumers already have access to a wide variety of product choices that are certified, organic, uh, certified as organic under the U.S. Department of Agriculture's National Organic Program. By definition, products that are certified organic do not contain genetically engineered ingredients. In addition, consumers may also purchase uh, products that companies have voluntarily labeled as not containing genetically engineered ingredients. While I most certainly, uh, most certainly acknowledge the role and responsibility of the legislature to act to protect the interests of consumers of the state, the scientific consensus and support of safety and nutritional equivalents of foods derived from biotechnology leads to the conclusion that the public is not at risk. However, consumers would be harmed by confusion and increased cost of food as a result of imposing a mandatory label. It would also hi I would also highlight for the committee a deeply flawed inconsistency included in the bill, the broad exemptions. If the matters this bill attempts to address are so paramount and of such abiding interest to the legislature, then why are there so many exemptions? In many cases, these exemptions are applied in just the places where a consumer arguably knows the least about the food and beverages he or she may be consuming, like restaurants, food carts, and vending. To conclude, given, the FDA, uh, given that the FDA and numerous other scientific and regulatory bodies that I've previously mentioned have determined that food products containing uh, ingredients derived from gen genetically engineered in plants are safe and that they are materially no different from con their conventional counterparts, a mandatory label declaring the presence of these ingredients does not provide the consumer with any information that is useful or actionable. The limited space on a food label sh uh, should be reserved for critically important food safety and nutritional information that can allow consumers to make safe and helpful choices. I thank you for your time and my, and my uh, testimony. Thank you. Mr. Rosen. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Dinowitz, members of the committee, sponsor Rosen Rosenthal. Uh, my name is Michael Rosen. I'm the senior vice president of the Food Industry Alliance of New York State. 
Uh, we're a statewide not-for-profit trade association representing the interests of all sizes of food stores. I have a written statement which I'd like read into the record, and I, uh, with your permission, I'll summarize our key points. We're opposed to this bill, and the reason is we're opposed to any state-specific labeling. We would have the same position if this were a hearing on state labeling of caffeine or sugar. We believe it will lead to the unavailability of product and uh, higher prices for consumers. We're particularly concerned about how it will affect imported product. Consumers today expect a wide variety of ethnic products to be available in their stores, and we see all kinds of problems in having the, those products available uh, in the marketplace. We're particularly concerned about how it will affect the merchandising of fresh produce. Under the bill, uh, raw agricultural products uh, that contain uh, GMO, either uh, completely or partially, must be labeled with the specific phrase, genetically engineered. But what seems even more confusing, if you have products that are neither GMO nor certified organic, in that instance, the product must be accompanied by a sworn statement that said it was not made with GMO and it was not intentionally commingled with a GMO product. Uh, the bill doesn't define what a sworn statement means, and presumably it doesn't mean a notarized statement or that a farmer has to give uh, an oath on a Bible, uh, but it would seem to mean something more than just a notation on an invoice. So we believe it means that each shipment of non-GMO product is going to have to be accompanied by an original signed statement uh, attesting that it's non-GMO. And to give you a feel for how burdensome this will become, a typical large supermarket today has over 500 separate SKUs of fresh produce at any one time. And for us, those are all perishable products. They turn over usually at least once a week, sometimes more than a week. And as we get product from different suppliers, we're going to have to keep track of all of that paperwork for each separate shipment. So just think of us merchandising 15 uh, different kinds of tomatoes. Originally, we might uh, have a supplier in Mexico, then in Florida, then in Virginia, New Jersey, and then locally here in New York as growing seasons change. With each shipment, we're going to have to match up the paperwork with what we're doing on the shelves. We're going to have to separate bins. We're probably going to have to throw out a lot of product. It's going to be a paperwork nightmare. We also have a concern about the labeling of product. And uh, this bill is very specific in what it mandates. It says uh, the product must contain the phrase produced with genetic engineering and that phrase must be on either the front or the back panel. So we have a concern that we're going to have some imported product or a product made in another state that's going to contain a slightly different phrase, like contains genetic engineering instead of produced genetic engineering. Or the disclosure will be on a side panel instead of the front or back. Under the terms of this bill, we can't sell it. So. Uh, we also have a concern about uh, the exemption given for restaurants. Food stores today sell a lot of prepared foods. This bill exempts food made for immediate human consumption, uh, but only when it's sold in a restaurant. So we're going to have situations where a supermarket is going to be next to a restaurant, and they're both going to be selling takeout food. The product may have identical ingredients. They might be selling a salad or some other meal. But under this bill, the restaurant doesn't have to label. They don't have to incur the cost of tracking all that paperwork I spoke of. But we do. We believe that competitors selling the exact same product in the same state should be treated equally. So in closing, we're opposed to this bill just as we would oppose any state-specific labeling. We believe this is a matter that has to be addressed at the federal level. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Oh, good. Uh, so on the, on the issue of the restaurants having an unfair advantage, would the bill be less objectionable if the – I'm just curious now because I'm not suggesting any amendments. Uh, would it be less objectionable if that exemption for restaurants were eliminated? Well, I would suggest that perhaps you want to exempt all prepared foods.
I thought so, but I'm, I'm, I'm just asking if, if the um, requirements were the same one way or another, would that help? One way or another, that I don't want to lead you to believe that we would support it either way, but it would make it less I'm just uh, objectionable. Okay. Now, the issue brought up regarding the, this uh, paperwork, uh, the sworn statement, mm -hmm. again, I'm just curious if, if that if that weren't a factor, would you find the bill less objectionable, or less are you just going to be are you just going to be against the bill? Period. No matter well, what happens. Well, we're against. I started out by saying we're against state labeling. So right. anything that makes it less burdensome is better. I looked at the general construction law to try to learn what a sworn statement made, and I have a copy of it here, but. It's not really clear, but to us, it would seem to at least mean an original signed statement has to accompany each shipment. And I, I don't know what the sponsor's intent is, but that seems awful burdensome. Would, would you say one of your main objections is that it's a state bill instead of a federal bill? Absolutely. So, for example, and I don't expect the current House of Representatives to do anything good or productive under the current leadership, but just suppose that, I, I that Congress that. did pass uh, this bill as a federal bill, would you have a big problem with that? I, I better move away from Lewis, but uh, probably not. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, it's been said, and uh, is there any reason you would disagree with the uh, assertion that because this deals with a process issue rather than ingredient labeling, that there's no federal uh, preemption issue, there's no problem uh, legally in terms of labeling itself? I, w I would say there are probably interstate commerce issues. Mm -hmm. This would seem to clearly impede the flow of product uh, into New York. When, we, when the state sought to impose state-specific labeling under the bottle law, that was struck down at, uh, by the federal courts. And one of the issues they looked at was whether the state was trying to affect the behavior of manufacturers in other states. I don't, I mean, I think we try to affect people in other states all the time by some no. of the things we do. You, Okay. Do, you, do you have any comment on any of those? I, I think that you also um, create a significant constitutional question on the First Amendment on compelled speech, on mandating a label which has no, n no basis in safety or health. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Assemblymember Rosenthal if she has anything. Um, thank you. Could you explain to me why having a label um, would suggest that the product is not safe? That when the government mandates a special label on a product, uh -huh. it provides consumers with information telling them that there's something that they need to be concerned about or something they need to be more aware of than any other aspect of it. You don't put special labels on products unless there's a safety or health risk. Okay, so I use Sweet and Low, and I've used it for many, many years, um, but that has, you know, this contains, you know, it has a warning label on it. I still buy it. So do many, many people buy sweet and low just for an example. And many, many and people. And I know what's, I know that perhaps there's a certain risk. I still buy it. Um, given the lack of clear proof that it's safe, why would you object to giving consumers the information they want to know? We base our policies on sound science. We believe that the FDA bases their positions on sound science, and if there was any compelling evidence um, to present it to FDA that scientific st studies indicate that there are health or safety risks under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, FDA would be forced to act. Okay, but you, you know, we've gone through before the fact that the FDA has sat on the sidelines for various and sundry reasons. So in the absence of FDA um, action, the states have it upon them to act. Again, the, our federal food safety laws are mm -hmm. based upon sound signs. Okay. The FDA is tasked with those responsibilities by, our federal, by, by the Congress, and FDA bases their, their, their labeling requirements mm -hmm. on safety and nutritional content. Okay. Can you tell me how much uh, 
money and lobbying costs. The, um, the Grocery Manufacturers Association has spent uh, lobbying against labeling. Ma'am, I would have to get you that in writing after the fact. Just for the, the ballpark? I'm not sure. Okay. So as I asked a question, I asked a panelist earlier, um, labels are changed all the time. You know, first new, then it's imp once you're hooked, then it's improved, then maybe it's light, and maybe it's fewer calories. I mean, labels are not printed and then used for the next 10 years. So um, in addition, when our food is exported to all these other countries, don't they need different labels? in different countries, you know, different languages, different requirements in, in the more than 60 countries around the world that require labeling. The economic analysis that was done in relation to a mandatory label was based upon a number of factors, not just the cost in physically changing the label, but the likely costs in additional inputs or possible switching of ingredients because of possible sales fall-offs because of the safety and warning, because the warnings that consumers would imply from that label. I mean, isn't the industry built to be responsive to what the consumer wants? I mean, you do all this research to say that, let's say, this year, let's say, cinnamon is the best ingredient in cereal, so all of a sudden every cereal has cinnamon, right? So, so if, if, all these polls, and it was an ABC poll and now a New York Times poll that show that an overwhelming majority in the 90s, people want this kind of labeling. Why are you so resistant to it? We continue to believe that we provide consumers with the choices that they, re but that they ask for. consumers say they want more. They want more, and you know the insistence against giving them more leads one to believe that you're trying to hide something. We believe that the, that the label will be inherently misleading and confusing well, to consumers without, with, without, but without, how broad, is it misleading? without broad public education about the benefits of the technology. Why don't you do broad public education then? It's not our technology. We just use the safest, most affordable ingredients. <sighs> okay, I guess I'm not going to uh, persuade you. I just, I just haven't gotten the right answer. I haven't gotten an answer that satisfies what my constituents are demanding, you know? It, it, it's, it's not a satisfactory answer, it's a rote answer. Would you have something different to say? I would, thank you. Yeah. you okay, keep... listen, time out. We can't do this the whole day with you interrupting. I've seen certain mayoral candidates with greater self-control than some of you have. Please. <laughs> Let them testify. We're here to hear their answers. We're here to hear their testimony. You have the absolute right to submit written testimony within a week. Please don't be rude and please don't interrupt. Thank you. I'm sorry. That's okay. May Listen I to the chairman. I, I actually want to want to um, add another question for you because you you talked about international imports and the FDA uh, just a couple of days ago um, said that they would be issuing long-awaited rules that require imported food to meet the same safety standards as food produced in the United States. So the fear that you, you mentioned about foods coming in, the FDA is actually um, clamping down on that. That's great. Uh, the, the more consistency, uh, the better. Uh, the, you keep mentioning this example of a manufacturer who uses a new phrase like, you know, new and improved or light or whatever, that's fine because it's voluntary labeling. So for us, it's probably the same stock I'm keeping unit. I'm just speaking unit. to the cost of changing the labels. Oh, well, I, I'm looking at it in terms of what's available in the marketplace, and which, and of course, shortages lead to higher prices. but. The point that I wanted to make was if one of the manufacturers puts a new label on a product, we can buy that product with or without the label. We can commingle them on the shelves. It's completely voluntary. The problem with mandatory labeling is if it doesn't have 
that specific phrase, we can't sell it. So what our fear is that large companies are going to have to run special production runs just for New York. There's going to be a window when we're going to have to buy the product for New York. They might do a soup run in August. We might say, we don't want to buy soup in August. We want to buy it in October, but we're going to have to buy it. We're going to have to warehouse, and when it runs out, it's not going to be available. So that's our concern with state-specific labeling. Well, you know, I, I passed a law some years ago that requires that um, clothing with any kind of fake or real fur has to be labeled specifically. And in New York, it has to say faux fur. So, you know, that's the law. They have to comply. And I'm sure there are plenty of other examples. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't put you out of business. It informs the consumer who is actually going to be grateful to the company that does disclose whether it has or has not GMO. It may be. I think the volume of food sold through supermarkets is a little larger than uh, consumers buying faux fur. Well, it's an example. Well, hopefully it is. But it's an example of the fact that New York State has a state-specific labeling law on that. And the companies survive and make lots of money. And it's yeah. consumers who want to know and are grateful for the knowledge. Yeah. And that's what, all we're asking for here. Yeah, one of the ways my members stay competitive in the marketplace when a small regional chain competes with a large retailer like Walmart is they work with a food broker to buy overstock products. So the broker may call up and say, I've got an oversupply of ocean spray cranberry juice in Illinois. And we go, great, I'll buy eight boxcars full of it, we ship it by rail, and the next week we put it on sale. If we have state-specific labeling, we lose that flexibility. Mm -hmm. That's why I keep saying we think we need a national system. Well, a national system would be great. The problem is that Monsanto has poured millions upon millions of dollars blocking such legislation which is why we have to take it on the state level. You know, Thank this you. is the Consumer Protection Committee, and we're looking at availability and cost to consumers. And in order to further protect consumers, I'm going to read the, name, the license plates of four cars that need to be moved. You ready? Yep. White BMW 2013 EJP 8086. Blue Dodge Charger 5BW L37, Black Kia Jeep 2012 FSX 8332, and Blue Lincoln Navigator, which is a very big car, 1998. I assume it's not by one of the environmentalists here. Um, EXT 1935. All those cars need to be moved, or you may, they may be moved for you. So if you're in here with that, please do that. Um, I just wanted to either make a few comments and just ask a few questions. I happen to think that most manufacturers are very flexible, resilient, adaptable to changing conditions. Um, you know, I'm not saying I got this done, but I remember a number of years ago I was looking at a, at a peanut butter jar and it said, choosy mothers choose Jif. And I found that objectionable and sexist. So I wrote a letter. Now, uh, maybe it was coincidence, but they changed it to make it. I think I think that's the product that did that. They they it was it was it was sexist. So I don't like things like that. People make changes when they have to. They make changes when people when consumers demand it. Um, I don't know personally if I think GMO food containing GMOs are harmful. I really I don't know. What I do know is that when I. When I'm reading this story that says that they're transferring genes from uh, pigs to plant life or from viruses to plant life, I'm not sure that that's harmful either, but it kind of creeps me out. And I think I, I personally think we want to know that. So the, the issue here, and I've said it repeatedly, is not necessarily, and I think you focus more on the issue, is not necessarily whether GMOs are good or bad, but simply uh, the consumer's right to know and then make an, a, their own decision as to whether they want to buy a product. Um, the legislation has passed in a couple of states uh, which is dependent upon 
probably New York passing it as well, because I think the legislation may say that, it, uh, that if enough population uh, contained in those states passes it, then it will take effect. So you, you could conceivably get to a point where maybe you don't have a national, uh, con uh, where not every state is passing it, but if every state in a particular region passes the legislation, then perhaps it might not be quite the burden on the manufacturers you're talking about because it's a whole region of the country with a large population. And you know, the other thing is when certain states like New York and California pass uh, consumer legislation, environmental legislation, that tends to bring a lot of other states along because then manufacturers uh, realize that, that that's, those are the population centers. So it, it certainly is quite conceivable that if New York passes this, that it could sort of open up the floodgates for other uh, states doing the same thing and, you, and, and that which you want to see accomplished, which is to have everybody have the same labels, could very well uh, be accomplished if that happened. Just saying. Well, Connecticut did pass a law that doesn't go into effect unless other states enact similar legislation. Maine, I believe, passed a law that just is going to require GMO labeling, which... Has a trigger. Oh, it has a trigger? Well, I was going to say we should see what I, happens in Maine. No, I think they both have the same well, trigger. That's too bad. Uh, do, do any, any, does anybody else have a, 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 a Assemblyman McGabbers Act? A statement was made that um, it's not a satisfactory answer. And quite, an, quite honestly, I don't know that any answers here today are going to be satisfactory to everyone. It's quite clear where the crowd, the, the audience, where they're leaning. So regardless of what's going to be said by some people, they're going to clap and cheer for, and others they're going to take exception to. I'm here because I want to listen to both sides. I want to be able to make the decision, a rational decision and an educated decision, as far as what needs to be done in terms of labeling. Now, I do not necessarily, I'm not necessarily against labeling, but I think how we get there I think is important. I think some of the issues that, that you brought up I, I think are important. I think people, whichever side of the issue you're on, you really need to take a look at and listen objectively. Um, because of uh, a few emails that I had gotten earlier, uh, I've actually bought some organic products recently. Um, and, you know, I probably will continue to. but. I think you, br you bring up some important points in terms of, and I know the question's already been answered, that you'd be less opposed to a, a national standard uh, of labeling. Um, and I, I think in the optimal point, I, I, I think that's probably where I would like to see it go. Uh, I'm not going to close any option to anything else, but I think that's probably the way it should go. Um, it was also mentioned. Uh, just on, on the sworn statement part, that concerns me because, as you mentioned, where does the sworn statement have to come from? Is it, it every it farmer, to, every producer of the product? It has to come from the producer, uh, which in most cases will be the farmer because we're talking about raw agricultural product. So then it would have to go to the farmer if it's an animal. It would have to go to the slaughterhouse if it's not uh, an animal, then it would have to go to, to the distributor and then to the retailer. And as I mentioned, we have over 500 f fresh SKUs in the typical produce department. You also mentioned about, uh, I believe the bill requires that the label has to be um, either on the front or back and contain certain specific language. I, I see from a manufacturing or distribution standpoint where that could be problematic. Uh, I know the FDA requires a specific label. Would there be an objection to the inclusion of GMO content or, or something within that label as opposed to a separate label identifying a product as GMO? Well, the more flexibility, the better, and the more likelihood that a product will uh, remain available in the New York marketplace. So we were pointing out that this bill is very, very specific in what it mandates and doesn't allow for any deviation. Assemblyman, if I could just offer, the Nutrition Facts Panel is 
exclusively the purview of the Food and Drug Administration. So dealing with the ingredient list and the nutritional content would, would, it would be something specifically uh, would, would have to be authorized by the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, the last point I want to make is the fact that the FDA was uh, recognized for clamping down on uh, the import food. So if we can go ahead and, and say FDA is good here, we can accept what the FDA says here. Uh, it's a, a, I guess it's a pick and choose where you want to accept what the FDA does. On one hand, you're saying it's good that the FDA is cracking down on the import food and labeling um, as it comes into the United States. On the other hand, the FDA has is, is kind of said that GMO is, um, is not harmful, but we don't accept that. Uh, the example you used on the foreign uh, verification rule was part uh, was FDA was directed to advance that rulemaking by the food by the uh, Food Safety Modernization Act enacted three years ago uh, that the grocery manufacturers and our membership strongly supported. Um, it's to create parity between the um, oversight responsibilities that FDA has over the domestic supply as well as imported food. Um, th there's a fair number of, um, of foodborne illness outbreaks that come from imported foods where foreign producers haven't abided by simple things like hand washing. Um, we commented publicly that was quoted in papers in the last three days that we are strongly supportive of FDA advancing those rules and hope that, that the foreign rule is just number three of about 50 rules that they will advance under the Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, we support the science-based approach that FDA takes on all food safety and um, base our decision-making on that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> just to get on to the fear factor, not, not the TV show, but the... Um, you know, I, I can honestly say until this bill landed on my desk in late May, beginning of June, wherever it was, I, I had no idea what a GMO was. Um, I mean, since that time I've done a tremendous amount of reading on the issue, and I still have no clear answer on it. Um, and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of emphasis has been placed on polls. I'm, I'm, I'm of the opinion, give me a result, I'll give you a poll. But that being said, there's clearly a large segment of the population, whether it is 98.5% or 80% or 60%, whatever it is, there's still a large segment of the population that is interested in GMOs. Um, where, where, where do you see the fear factor coming into play if all the label would specifically say is that this, contain, this product contains GEs or genetically modified organisms? Just, just to, 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 to piggyback on that, you know, I'm a parent of a child with a peanut allergy. So I pay attention when, an, when a product says may contain traces of peanuts. Now, granted, I'd probably say the vast majority of products that have that label on it do not contain peanuts, do not contain even traces of peanuts. They just may have been produced in a, in a, in a facility that may have had peanuts in it. But I pay attention to that. I guarantee you the vast majority of the population doesn't pay attention to that label. I mean, I think what I'm saying is that if we put the GMO label on the, the, the package, I think those people that are interested in having GMO-free products would steer clear of those products. And the rest of the nation, which I would probably say is, you know, a decent amount of people, wouldn't care. They wouldn't pay attention to it. Or if they really, you know, said, oh, maybe let me, let me find out what a GMO is and let me realize that 75, 80 percent of the food that I'm buying has it anyway, so, like, it's not going to make a big difference. I mean, where, where do you see the fear factor coming into play? Well, would you mind if I start with the peanut you could, item that you... That you and, and I understand that's scientific. Right. I, I understand that. I don't know the science. Sure. Well, one of the great promises of the technology, and I assert to you that I'm not a scientist, but I read a fair amount of this, much like all of you are during this discussion. There's research being done at three major uh, universities to turn off the protein, the gene in peanuts that caused the allergy. Now, you may not be able to ever get an allergen-free peanut, but it would dramatically reduce the risk so that when you say it was your son, so when your son is in a classroom and there's peanut butter, you're not fearful that, that and, th and there's research being done on gluten to help with celiac and gluten intolerance. Um, on the fear factor, it, it comes back to, to, to the simple premise that when the government mandates a label, mandates a label, allergens is a great example. The government mandates a label for allergens to ensure the health and safety, to protect your son, to protect those with peanut allergies, to protect those with other allergies. 
When the government mandates a, spe a special label on a product, it's there for a very specific reason for health and safety. There's no health or safety risk associated with genetic engineered ingredients. And people understand that. When you're looking, when, whether, you're looking whether you're looking for it or not, the label is there. Okay? Right. And so the, the, the issue that, that's being addressed is when government mandates there's a special label, that that label gives additional information. Now, moreover, it, there's a, a universe of people, many of them in this room, that don't want to buy products with genetically engineered ingredients. And, and that's okay. And that's great. And there are a world of products out there, a variety of products out there that are certified organic, that they know and trust, don't have those genetically engineered ingredients. With 70 to 80 percent of, of the food that's, that people consume on a daily basis, having these ingredients included in them, it makes far more sense to, lab to label for the absence than it does the presence. That way, those that are interested in looking for the alternative know how to find the alternative, and we have uniformity in that. I mean, and I recognize the fact that, that, that the new FDA regulations applying to imports apply to the nation as a whole, which is a lot more simple to deal with than on a state-by-state -state basis. But, for example, as a kosher consumer, I mean, there are products where I can buy, I mean, pick a product that is produced in a plant in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that has a kosher certification on it, but the same exact product that's produced in a plant in... Delaware doesn't have the certification on it. So, you, I mean, you do have differing labels within a region, even within, even within a state, depending on where it was produced. Couldn't, I mean, so, so where would the difficulty be in labeling? I mean, I, I understand that, that on a state-by-state -state basis it, it may get a little bit difficult, especially when dealing with imported products, products that are coming from, you know, China, Japan, Israel, you know, wherever they're coming from. But, you know, it is done. I mean, it is done on a, on a limited basis. I mean, you know, and and if and the truth is, if you're if you're selling to a to an audience, I mean, if you're selling in in, in uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, you know, you're clearly going to sell a product with ha that has a certain certification on it, as opposed to if you're selling in in you know Flushing Queens. You know, it, it's so. My point is, is, isn't isn't there already a system whereby we have different labels for different areas or for different products? But those are voluntary. This is a mandated label. Okay. I, I, I hear you. Thank you. Just one question, uh, Mr. Rosen. Um, I, I think it is, as one of my colleagues said, I think it is important that we consider uh, making the bill palatable not just for the end user but for the people you know, in the process of getting to that point. Um, do you imagine that your uh, alliance, your association, would be willing to withdraw its uh, opposition if uh, there was a provision that removed the, the part about the sworn statements from farmers, as well as a trigger provision similar to what Connecticut has, where that, you know, therefore you don't have a state-specific bill necessarily, you know, and it requires X number of states or X population before it takes effect. You know, then you're not talking about a state-specific measure. Can you see if, if, you know, if we, in your eyes, fix those two parts of the bill, um, withdraw your, your, your organization's objection to, to what we're talking about here? It would have to be a really big trigger. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, Mr. Frankel from the Grocery Manufacturers Association, you've mentioned this 70 to 80 percent statistic of foods currently on the shelves that have genetically modified ingredients. Where does that statistic come from? What's that based on? I'd be happy to get you uh, the information. It was based on two economic analysis, one by Northbridge Associates and one by the University of California, Irvine. Okay. That would be helpful. Um, another question for you. Um, I mentioned earlier that Whole Foods uh, supermarkets have announced that they will be requiring uh, GMO labeling on products sold in their stores. Uh, it's my understanding that the Grocery Manufacturers Association has come out against Whole Foods' decision on that front. We've taken no position, and my member companies would have to make those business decisions for themselves. I, I would then, in your follow-up uh, written comments, uh, direct you to a New York Times story of March 8, 2013. And if you can examine that story sure. and see if uh, 
your association has taken a point of that. I would say that Mr. Uh, Rosen, uh, to your right, uh, has already said that he favors voluntary labeling, and I think uh, um, in any event that, that uh, that's an important thing that's going on. Uh, I will ask you a question that I asked the earlier panel. Do either of you know, though, why the Whole Foods market has decided to have its requirements kick in in 2018 to wait five years? I, I don't. Um, and then this topic was certainly uh, alluded to, but I think it's important to ask the direct question of, of both of you. Can you in any sense quantify what the cost would be if uh, the bill as stands were enacted to uh, have labeling in New York State? The, the, only, the only information I could provide you with, and it's not New York specific, um, was economic analysis done in California um, while California was considering a very similar measure um, that was a ballot measure, Prop 37, uh, last year uh, that was defeated by California voters. Who, and, and, and the economic analysis said uh, it would cost uh, every consumer 300 to $400 every year per, per, per family per year going forward um, for the mandatory label. Who was that economic analysis? Uh, where, it was the same. That? It was the same. Northbridge Associates. It was the same economic analysis that had the 17 to 80 percent, which I'd be happy to get to. And who paid for that analysis? Do the you know? campaign opposing Proposition 37. Okay. Um, thank you. I appreciate the answer. Um, I have a. I have a, one more. One more question. Um, are you Are you aware that? Um, with DM, DNA randomly inserted into genes that um, the creation of new allergens is a, is a distinct possibility with GMO foods? Ma'am, I'm not an expert on the, on the technology. But have you heard of those cases? Uh, I have not, no. Okay. Well, they do, they do exist. Maybe, maybe you can look into that. And the fact that new allergens are being created... Um, and they do not have to be labeled as GMO foods. Um, new allergens in GMO foods are being created. So there are so many people in more and more every day developing, di being diagnosed with allergies to nuts, for example. Um, don't you think it's incumbent upon the industry to protect the consumers by advising them that GMOs are in those products? Ma'am, to the best of my knowledge, I'm unaware of any nuts in the marketplace. Well, you said you're not an expert, so take what I say as it happens. So okay. given that scenario, don't you think it's incumbent upon the industry to protect consumers who are allergic to nuts and various other allergens and newly created allergens in GMO food? And FDA, under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, already regulates special labels for allergens, which present... No, but newly risks. created allergens that the FDA is not supervising when you create your GMO foods? I would have to defer to FDA under the allergens program. So what if the FDA said we, we have to have labeling, GMO labeling? If FDA said we, had, we would have to label for health or safety, then we would absolutely label for health and safety. Oh, you wouldn't fight it? If FDA said that we had to label no, but, for health and you safety. Know, before the FDA says they have you know, hearings and et cetera, would you testify on behalf of labeling? Ma'am, that all depends on what the facts and circumstances are of the label that well, they Well, similar to propose. this legislation. A, a mandatory label, we would oppose. Even, with, if, without even, health, even without on a federal reasons. level. We would oppose any, any special mandatory label that's not based on health or safety. But it is health and safety if you're developing new allergens in the food. And we would defer to FDA to tell us that there's health or safety risks. And if they mandate a special label for health and safety specific to any ingredient or anything in our product, we would be supportive of that only for health and safety. Okay. Um, the question I asked earlier that you didn't have the answer to is to how much money in lobbying costs. Um, I hope you send that answer to the chair sure. so he can distribute that to us. Happy, Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next witnesses are Patty Lavera, Food and Water Watch, Andrew Kimbrell, Center for Food Safety, and Stacy Orwell, GMO Free New York. Please raise your hands. Do you swear that your testimony will be the truth? 
I do. Okay, please state your names one at a time and your affiliations. Stacey Arell, a campaign director for GMO Free New York. Uh, Patty Lavera from Food and Water Watch. Andrew Kimbrell, Center for Food Safety. Okay, um, any particular order? You choose. Um, I was going to say good morning, but it's good afternoon now. Um, yes, it is. Yes. So uh, I'm the campaign director for GMO Free New York, a grassroots organization advocating for the passage of Bill A3525A. Um, this is Kathleen Fury, our education and media director, who unfortunately can't be here next to me. Thank you, Chairman Dinowitz and the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Education uh, Protection for inviting us to present testimony. GMO Free New York takes the stand that we have the right to know if our foods have been genetically engineered. This is not about being liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat. If you eat food, then this issue affects you. 64 countries have enacted GE food labeling laws, but the U.S. and Canada stand alone among industrialized nations in keeping their citizens dining in the dark. As we've noted, 93% of Americans want GE foods labeled, yet the FDA is holding fast to an inadequate and outdated policy which states labeling isn't necessary because genetic engineering is almost identical to traditional crossbreeding and GE foods are substantially equivalent to conventionally grown foods. We emphatically disagree. Nowhere but in the labs of Monsanto and DuPont can you evolve soybean plants that are factories for producing bacterial pesticide. And no matter how much Barry White music, mood lighting, and wine you ply them with, nowhere on the farm will you find a bacterium getting it on with an ear of corn. The FDA, ignoring the warnings of its own scientists about the health risks of GE foods, quietly introduced them into our food supply in 1996 without our knowledge. We've been eating them ever since. GE soy and corn show up in hundreds of ingredients. Aspartame? Yep. Maltose? Yes siree. Caramel color? You betcha. Vitamin B12? Who'd have thunk it? High fructose corn syrup? Well, that one's a dead giveaway. American children 17 years and younger have been eating GE foods their entire lives. All of the top-selling baby formulas have GE ingredients. Talk about being unwitting guinea pigs. And rather than conducting its own safety studies, as we've heard, the FDA asks the very companies that have invested years and millions to develop GE seeds to do their own testing and then voluntarily consult with the FDA about the results. The burden of proof of safety has been left to those who stand the gain the most from it. This is a blatant conflict of interest. So how can we possibly trust the FDA's assurances that GE foods are safe, especially when the biotech industry blocks independent peer-reviewed research by hiding behind patent law protections and claims of confidential business information. Once GE foods have reached the supermarket aisles, the FDA has zero oversight. Without labeling, as we've heard, health problems that might already be occurring can't be identified or tracked. But there is a growing body of evidence that GE foods do pose risks to human health. When we eat GE crops that make bacterial pesticide, some of it is being absorbed into our bloodstream to unknown effect. In a new study, pigs fed GE soy and corn had an increased risk of stomach inflammation and uterus abnormalities. Pig organ systems are very similar to those of humans. Another study, which got no media attention, showed that exposure to glyphosate, the active ingredient in the herbicide Roundup, promotes the growth of certain human breast cancer cells. This effect was magnified when glyphosate was combined with a compound found in soybean. Many varieties of GE soybean are designed to be doused in Roundup. I come from a family with a very strong history of breast cancer, so not being able to identify the presence of GE soybean in my food is of great personal concern. In response to these legitimate health concerns and the void left by the FDA, at least 25 states have active GE food labeling bills. As we've mentioned, Connecticut and Maine passed laws last month, and Alaska has had a law on the books since 2005 for labeling GE fish should it ever come to market. Biotech and big food companies have been on the attack against state labeling laws and even threatened to sue state legislatures in the past. They've also engaged in a deliberate campaign of misinformation to confuse and scare farmers, manufacturers, consumers, and legislators. And so I'm now going to take this opportunity to call them out on some of their more outrageous claims. The cost to change our ad labels is negligible. Cereal manufacturers redesign their packaging every time swimmer Michael Phelps wins another gold medal at no added cost to consumers. So why should it be any different to add a GE label? It won't be. 
which means that those claims of grocery bills increasing by $400 per year for the average family are flat out false. Despite what the New York Farm Bureau claimed today and in their opposition memo, under implementation of Bill A3525A, the food products of an animal raised on GE feed will not require a label as long as the animal itself was not genetically engineered. Farmers will not be denied access to new agricultural technologies. This bill neither bans the cultivation of GE crops nor restricts their manufacture or sale. Furthermore, saying that all consumers already have the means to avoid GE foods by buying those labeled certified organic or non-GMO is completely out of touch with reality. Organic foods are often more expensive and not readily available in all markets, placing an undue burden on low-income families seeking to avoid GE foods. Monsanto, the Grocery Manufacturers Association, and Kraft have no right whatsoever to dictate New York food labeling policy. None of these entities is your constituent. We New Yorkers, who are your constituents and who elected you to represent our interests, want GE foods labeled. We demand transparency in our food system. If it's GMO, then label it. Thank you. Ms. Orwell. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Patty Lavera, and I'm the Assistant Director of Food and Water Watch, a nonprofit consumer advocacy organization. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here to have a really a critical and a detailed, and it's nice to have a long opportunity to talk about this really important issue to consumers everywhere. Um, so just to, to recap for just a second, the major commercially available GE crops include alfalfa, canola, corn, cotton, papaya, soy, squash, sugar beet, and some sweet corn. And so GE corn and soybeans we hear a lot about because these are the building blocks of the industrialized food supply. These make up the processed foods that many of us eat lots of. So, and we also are looking at the possibility quite soon, potentially, of genetically engineered animals such as genetically engineered salmon where the animal itself is genetically engineered. So as we've discussed, the FDA doesn't require uh, labeling of GE foods, but they do allow this voluntary labeling. But I think it's worth taking a second before we get into the legal back and forth of what that means. What it means in reality for consumers is that most of them are eating genetically engineered foods and they don't know it. These companies are not providing the voluntary affirmative labeling that it's there. Most people don't know what they're eating it, and as we've heard this morning from Dr. Hansen and others, that equates to really a missed opportunity to gather any information about these long-term health impacts. Impacts The system for studying these crops is completely inadequate. We need more safety testing, but we are running an experiment on the public. If we have 70 to 80 percent of these, uh, the foods that are out there that contain these ingredients, we don't inform people that they're eating them, how are you going to track adverse events? That is a missed opportunity and an experiment that shouldn't be done. So in addition to these unanswered questions about health impacts, and we've heard a good discussion of this this morning, there's a lot more growing public awareness about what GE crops are doing to our food system and the structure of agriculture. So we think that's really important, too. There's not enough time to get into that today. But more and more people are aware that the hype about genetic engineering is not being achieved. We are not seeing less chemical use, we're seeing more. We're seeing super weeds that don't die when they're hit with Roundup anymore. And as the more consumers learn about that, more and more and more of them want to avoid this technology, whether it's a health reason, an environmental reason, a choice for farmers reason. There's lots of reasons, and consumers need information to execute that choice. So we hear a lot. We're a consumer advocacy group. We work on a lot of labeling issues, from organic to country of origin labeling to GMO labeling. We hear about choice a lot from the industry, but I think they're defining choice a little differently than an average consumer would. This is not about choice on their terms as the suppliers of the food. This is so consumers can make meaningful choices about basic information about how food is produced. And so despite the PR that we get from the industry about how they're in the business of providing choices, they're really trying to decide for us. And that's why Food and Water Watch has been calling our campaign, Let Me Decide. We need labeling. We need information as consumers so we can decide for ourselves. So I just want to spend one quick second on this issue of cost and feasibility and how you make these labels work. A lot, as we've heard, almost everybody else in the developed world has these labels. Their experience has not been of increased cost for consumers. So there's some, st some study that came out of the United Kingdom that found a very low cost, and there's a different economic assessment that was done for Prop 37 in California that said the costs would be the opposite of what the industry-sponsored study said. It said it would be very, very low, as low as $1.27 in annual food expenditures per household. 
So what we need to do to have GE labeling are things we're already doing. These seeds are already labeled. Many markets are already segregating these crops because they have to to get into export markets. So we're not reinventing the wheel. We're asking for information that exists in this economic system already to be relayed to the end user, the consumer at the store. So you know, we can get into the specifics of what it means for grocery stores. We're happy to talk about that. We have experience with this on other labeling issues like country of origin labeling. But we think what it boils down to is that this is an incredibly basic piece of information. A growing body of consumers around the country want it because they know that their peers around the world already have it. Um, the public support for this, you know, just because we got a new poll over the weekend that showed 93 percent, it's not really news because for a decade the polls have always showed incredibly high public support for this. What's astonishing about it is really the consistency over time of how much of the public believes they have the right to know this. So we already get to know a lot of important things so we can make choices for ourselves and our families about our food, whether it's how much sodium is in there or what country it came from or, you know, really, really specific amounts about the weights and measures and the costs. This needs to, this information needs to be added to that portfolio so we can make good good choices for ourselves as consumers. So that's why Food and Water Watch is here to really strongly as possible urge the committee to pass uh, A3525. Thank you. I want to thank the chairman and the members of the assembly for this opportunity. Uh, it's really an unusual opportunity to discuss this issue at great depth with both sides represented. I'm an attorney and I'm the founder and executive director of the Center for Food Safety. Uh, for over 15 years, we've been involved in legislation on labeling. Uh, we have advised dozens of states and uh, federal legislators, including most recently Senator Boxer and, and DeFazio. I'm the author of the petition currently pending at the FDA for GMO labeling, uh, which is not yet, they have not yet decided how they're going. They tell us it's a very complicated issue and they're going to take some more time. Uh, we have 1.2 million Americans that have sent uh, comments in supporting that petition. Uh, so that we also have 350,000 members, tens of thousands of them here in New York State. Uh, even though I'm now uh, centered in Washington, D.C., I was raised in New York City, went to law school here, and spent three years working on a dairy farm in Columbia County. Uh, my success or failure at that dairy farm can be determined by the fact that after that I went to law school because it's a hard business, that dairy business. Um, I want to maybe just quickly, uh, the, m much of my written testimony is about how should this bill be enacted, it is not going to be susceptible to legal challenge. And I do want to get into that summary, it's obviously going to be difficult in a few minutes. But before that, I thought maybe we should clear up a couple of things. One is the FDA does not label, does not label its nutrition labeling or its process labeling because a product is unsafe or has been proven to be unhealthful. If you look at the back of your labels, red dye number two in that particular thing, or the irradiation label, which is required, a process required by the FDA, that all foods that have been irradiated be labeled, they did not do that because they found irradiation unsafe. They found it safe. Well, I may disagree with that. Many people here may. But the FDA found it safe. They labeled it because it has a material fact. It doesn't, you can't tell by looking at that product if something new has happened to it. It's called materiality. That is why we label. If something is proven to be unsafe, we take it off the shelves. We don't label E. coli poisoning. We take it off the shelves. So should we in the future, and Dr. Hansen summarized well, the growing amount of peer-reviewed scientific literature showing that there may be some severe safety concerns with these foods, we won't label them. We'll take them off the shelves. But one thing that is absolutely certain is that there are material changes in these foods, novel material changes. Well, how do we know that? We know that because Monsanto, DuPont, Dow, Syngenta, and Bayer have gotten hundreds of patents on these food additives because they are completely novel. They come before committees like this and say there's nothing new here. Well, then they go from the patent office and they get these patents on the agrobacterial vectors, on the novel genetic material, on the uh, cauliflower mosaic viruses, on the antibiotic marker systems, all of these that are part of every cell of every genetically engineered food, they have a patent on. So which is it? Nothing new here, then take away all your patents. Or your patents are there, and that means there's something very new here, otherwise you're breaking the patent law. Now let's quickly go over some of the things that have been discussed. Let's talk about the supremacy clause, right? People, you've heard this in the newspapers. Well, if you do pass this law, 
be a problem because there's a supremacy clause, in other words, federal preemption. As has been discussed earlier, not the case. We've cited our cases in, in our written testimony. Federal courts have already decided that as far as process labeling, like the FDA did with irradiation, and we are now saying should happen with genetic engineering, there is no federal preemption. End of story. End of story. If we were to try nutrition labeling, as has already been mentioned, the National Nutrition and Education Act, Labeling and Nutrition Act of, of 1990, does preempt. As far as process, not at all. So that's not an issue, so, so, so put the supremacy clause. What about the dormant commerce clause? Well, this bill has been written so that all foods coming in would have to be labeled exactly like foods that would be manufactured in state. So there's no discriminatory purpose with other states, so that goes out the window. What about the due process clause? There's no fundamental rights being challenged, so that goes out the window. So what's left is, and was mentioned in the previous panel, is commercial free speech. Now, commercial free speech, we come in, and, and, and Dr. Hansen mentioned this, if the only reason that this legislature would decide to pass this bill was mere consumer curiosity. Unfortunately, the Vermont bill, the, uh, the labeling of BGH, that was the only reason they had it. But we have heard today numerous reasons. And remember the, the, uh, the, the free speech is you can enact something that is reasonably related to fundamental state interests. Well, I think if a infant who has had soy formula and is having a rash or a, uh, having a, a toxic effect in that or an allergenic effect, if you go to your pediatrician and you say, look what's happened to my child, and they don't know that it might or might not be because that soy formula was genetically engineered, I think that's a relevant state interest. To know what happened to your child and have health professionals say, oh wow, this particular group of genetically engineered soy, remember, lots of different bacteria in there, lots of different viruses, that would then get them on the trail, the toxicological trail to trace that. We do not have that ability right now. Our health professionals in New York State do not have that ability, and that to me is a relevant state interest. There, the question was asked before about allergenicity. Well, we know that situation. We had Starlink. Starlink, there was a human allergen that got into the food, one of the largest food recalls in American history. That we have also seen um, billions of dollars lost in exports. So if you want to protect New York agriculture from the kind of catastrophe that's happened with our, our, our rice farmers, billions of dollars of loss when that got contaminated, no European market, no Japanese market. Uh, if you want to protect farmers in this state from that kind of catastrophe, this kind of bill is reasonably related to that self-interest. I would also quickly would, I want, to ask, uh, I want to answer Assembly Rosenthal's question, which is why are they so opposed? Why are they here? They're here because they have failed to provide a single advantage to the American consumer in 30 years of research. A single, no one gets up in the morning wanting to buy a genetically engineered food. It no better, no less cost, no more nutrition, no and nothing, no less fat, no nothing. They sell a lot more of their chemicals, that's why they love it. They haven't offered a single advantage, which means if it is labeled, they're advertising their failure as an industry to market anything that's attractive to the consumer. They're only marking, only that would be labeling saying, hey, we're only offering you more risk, same price. Who in the heck would buy that? But that's not our problem or your problem. Could you that's wrap up, problem. please? Could Pardon? you wrap up, please? That's it. My timing is perfect then, as usual. Thank you. No questions? No questions? No questions? Question for uh, uh, for Patty Lavera. Patty, you'd mentioned about something about the pigs and, and um, the, the uh, stomach inflammation. I did. I'm sorry. Stacy. Stacy. I'm sorry. Stacy. I'm sorry. That's okay. What was was that a published report or where, where did that come from? Yeah, that was a study that came out um, actually the day I met with you in your office. Um, the study was done at a pig farm in, I believe, in Iowa, and the pigs were fed from um, birth, or from weaning to slaughter, I think it was a 23-week period. Um, they divided the pigs into two groups. One group was fed the standard diet of GE corn and soy, and the other group was fed non-GE <coughs> corn and soy. And then at, uh, at the time of slaughter, they were then autopsied, and I don't feel qualified to go into all of the details, but the, the conclusions or the results were that the pigs that had been fed the genetically engineered corn and soy had 
um, a much higher incidence of stomach inflammation. And in the female pigs, there were uterine abnormalities. Um, I believe they were uh, significantly or 25% larger in size than normal. And the reason that that study was done was, first of all, that it was um, instead of being in a lab somewhere on, in lab rats, it was you know pigs raised under the conditions that pigs are raised in this country, and also because the organ systems of pigs are very similar to humans, which is why we you know use them for organ transplants as well. Was this study the one you're talking about in the Journal of Organic Systems? I believe so, but I don't have it in front of me. And so is that journal funded by a pro-organic farming federation? I can't answer that question. Um, did that also show that 15% of non-GM pigs uh, had heart abnormalities, while only 6% of those uh, GM-fed pigs did? And similar data was presented also relative to liver, uh, liver problems? What I do know is that after that study was released, the um, industry went on attack against it and published all of these, on certain websites, all of these supposed problems with the protocol and the way the data was analyzed, um, which is what also happened with the Serolini study that came out last October. So again, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a statistician, so I can't go into the the way the math was calculated, but um, other people that I spoke with, and, and you, we can recall Dr. Hansen back up here to, to speak more specifically about this, but I know Actually, that... Actually, no, we can't. <laughs> well, I think he would tell you that the results were sound. Okay. Though the authors claim no conflict of interest, the funding for the study itself was provided by Verity Farms, owned by one of the study's authors, which sells non-GMO grains. The only reason I bring that up is because you said let's call them out. Uh, but once again, I'm here because I want to listen factually to both sides. Okay, and regardless of whatever one side says, you're going to find someone on the other side that's going to refute it and, and vice versa. Okay, right. I'm trying to cut to the chase. I want to get to the information uh, that, that's relevant. Uh, each side can bring forth documentation or, or claims relative to what's good or, or what's bad about uh, GMOs, okay? Uh, we're talking about labeling. Uh, I just want to make sure that the information that I get, just as you say there's there's a tax, you know, That's on right. them, okay, quite honestly, from the organic groups, maybe, that they're attacking the other side, okay? So you have a food fight that's, that's kind Literally. of going on over here, okay? And, uh, you know, I, I just want to try and, and get to the point where, uh, like I said, uh, I believe that uh, in, in labeling, it's how we get there. When you, when you talked about, you know, you, you put on boxes, you know, uh, Wheaties or whatever, an Olympic champion, uh, that's okay because that box is going to go nationwide or, as opposed to something that may be state specific. Well, just two things. When I said I was going to call out, you know, false claims, I was specifically talking about some of the things that were in the New York Farm Bureau's opposition memo. I wasn't talking about the health studies. Um, and as far as the, the who funded the, this pig study goes, I would also point out that every single study that uh, resulted in the FDA, you know, rubber stamping the approval of, of a GE food was conducted by industry. Um, th thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon. Um, some of you referenced this already in your prepared remarks, but if uh, each of the three of you could say whether you agree with the estimate that was provided earlier as to the cost of labeling of GMO foods, and if not, what would you say roughly is the cost of uh, labeling here in New York State? I, I think the confusion, and some of it may be intentional, is in the cost of labeling or the calculation that, that would since it doesn't offer any advantages, as I mentioned, would lead the necessity of people actually changing their source. And they're saying, we don't want to use genetically engineered corn anymore. What would it cost us to go to non-genetically engineered corn? That's independent of labeling. That's a market decision. 
should a uh, producer decide that that in the market is justified by the cost they're seeing having to do with labeling, they'll make that decision. But that's not a cost of labeling, and that's the conflation of why you see these radically different uh, you know, sums, you know, $400 versus $1.27. The labeling itself is minimal, as has been suggested. As a matter of fact, it's pretty much non-existent. They change every 18 months anyway. However, then they're saying, yeah, but what if consumers really do reject us because we're not giving them anything or we haven't done enough of a PR campaign? They're trying to say, what would it cost us to completely change our food supply? That is really not a labeling cost. That's a cost that the market will decide, and they'll decide whether that investment is worth it or not, depending on what the market tells them as to when they truly inform consumers of what they should know. That's why you see the two different numbers. Yes, Food and Water Watch would agree with that. In my written testimony, which is longer, I do have some, some paragraphs about different studies with footnotes. I'm not going to go through all of them with inflation-adjusted $2,010, but the costs are much, much lower when there's an, uh, uh, someone is not paying for the study who hates labeling. So the other things I do want to point out, I mean, I, I'm from D.C. We're obsessed with deficits and budgets, so there is, it's worth having a second to talk about what does it cost the state of New York. This came up a lot in Prop 37 in California. You know, your, your Department of Ag and Markets is out there looking at things already. This can be added in a very basic way to something that's a spot check. This is not a test. We heard a lot this morning from the Farm Bureau about the cost of testing. This is not a testing-based bill. This is a paperwork-based bill, and we do lots of other labels for food based on paperwork. So if it's meat labeling for different things um, that folks find an advantage in the marketplace, like saying grass-fed and they get, you know, that we have the USDA ver process verified label on this, that, or the other. Those are paper statement-based. Country of origin is paper statement-based. This is not a new concept. This is something we do in other sectors of the food supply. And stores take this in when they take the product in. And, the, in fact, the, the bill says that, you know, for produce sections, they can put it on a placard, they can put it on a bin. They're already doing that for the price for the variety, they figure it out. For other foods, we can figure it out for this. This does not have to be the scenario that was painted this morning of this unmanageable thing. And in the rulemaking process, there will be a place for these industries to weigh in and say this is a flexible way to do it. Representing the consumer point of view, uh, all I can add to that is when, uh, when it became mandatory to label about the presence of the, the eight known allergen, human allergens, I don't recall prices going up on anything. Uh, I don't recall my grocery that bills national? going up. Is that nationally or, or state by state? Well, that's at the federal level. I'm, you know, I so I, I can't. I I concur with everything they've said. You know, I haven't conducted those studies. I am here representing the consumer, and I can just you know attest to what I know. I'm not going to pretend to be uh, well versed in in the the details of New York commerce. Uh, th comments. Thank you for those answers. It, um, it's been said, I think, numerous times uh, today that about 70 to 80 percent of products on grocery store shelves have genetically modified ingredients. Do any of you disagree with that uh, statistic? Well, I think it's important to say 70 to 80 percent of processed foods, which frankly we shouldn't be eating all that much of anyway, particularly those of, of a certain age who have cardiologists. Um, but whole foods, as Dr. Hansen mentioned, actually very few. Uh, there's no uh, meat, there's no fish, there's no uh, but in fruits and vegetables. You have a little bit of sweet corn, tiny bit of zucchini, a little bit of papaya, but all that whole part of your, your, your grocery store is not genetically engineered. So I think it's always important to, to say that when you take 70, 80 percent. Take that, that's just in your processed food section of your aisle. It's not having to do with your whole foods. Can I just interrupt you a second? You said, you said some papaya? Yeah, there's a little bit of papaya. My understanding is every papaya sold in the state of New York, in, in the United States, is genetic. Only if it's from Hawaii. Most of them come from Mexico and other places that are not genetically and engineered. What, and what, what, would you what would you consider a uh, seedless watermelon? A what? A seedless watermelon. It's not genetically engineered because genetically engineered means, means created in a laboratory with a, a bacteria vector that invades the cell and puts in there the novel genetic marker, the novel viruses, the novel antibiotic market systems. It is not traditional breeding. It is the beer and yeast argument doesn't apply here. That's why they were able to patent all these things, as I mentioned before. Oh, if I could just <laughs> continue with my, I think oh, yeah, would be my final question. Okay. Um, unless it needs any follow-up. Um, let me ask you, Mr. Kimbrell, would you be in favor of a bill that required non-GMO foods, that is foods without genetically modified organisms, to be labeled? 
Um, no, I would be adamantly opposed to that. And, and I would say because it puts the burden on the wrong people. So here's people, who's, here's farmers who have been using these traditional methods, who have been using conventional methods for millennia that have, and actually have created the agriculture system we have in America today. They're doing nothing new. Here are these other people come in, five chemical companies, with these new technology with all the problems we talked about. Why in the world would we put the burden on the traditional farmers to label when they're not doing anything different? We should put, those who are putting this in the marketplace, those patent holders should be the ones that are forced to label. We shouldn't put that burden on, on folks who've done nothing new. That makes no sense, zero sense at all. What, what burden are you referring to? Because I think the argument has been made by this panel that there isn't much of a burden uh, on the folks who would have to label under the bill. So what, when you refer to that burden, that what, would mean, what is it that you're That would mean to, to have to say to them, to those folks, okay, the non-GMO folks, you have to test your products. If you are using corn, soy right now, and, you're, and you have a processed food, you know very well that that has GMO content to it. But if you're saying every farm in America who is not using GMO, who is doing cucumbers, who is doing olives, who is doing wine, that they have to label their products as non-GMO? That makes no sense at all. The very few that are using corn and soy and the, and the five that were mentioned by Patty, the big five, it's much easier to have them law, uh, label the, the novel products that they're making rather than have every other farm in America who's not using GMO label non-GMO. That makes no sense. From a public policy point of view, you're putting a burden on millions and taking it off five companies and they're very, you know, those limited five ingredients. That doesn't make sense. Thank you. I happen to think that we that this bill should pass, but I must say, if your contention is is that the bill does not really place a burden on the GMO food manufacturers, then why would it be a burden to label the other way around? And in fact, I would think it would be good advertising. But well, people can do that, but again, let me repeat: corn. Don't so, please, please don't. No, repeat. no, I'm just saying this, it's all on the record. If you okay, I'm just it. saying that to answer your question, there's five, just five limited crops that are genetically engineered. There are hundreds and hundreds that are not. So why would you ask the people that are growing the hundreds and hundreds that are not genetically engineered to market their products as non-GMO? Why don't you just have the ones that are using the five market? Well, what about GMO? the other foods? Uh, I think they said earlier that a very high percentage of other types of products contain uh, genetically modified organisms. And if that's the case, then you're, and, I, and as I said, I think that they should be labeling. However, we would be placing the burden, it sounds to me, on the vast majority of food. So I'm just pointing out that your, your, your logic over there doesn't seem to fit with everything else you've said. Vast majority of food or vast majority of producers? That's my logic, is that you have hundreds and hundreds of producers out there, millions who are not using this. You have the few that are growing corn and soy for, for processed foods. Who okay. Would. E either way, if it's not a burden, then it's not a burden. If it is a burden, then it is a burden. Um, but, no, I, I was asking him the question. Thank you. Um, why don't you go on? Yeah, I've got one question. I just want to make one statement, though, and that is, you know, I represent, you know, many rural communities in Orange County, uh, and I really do take exception to the fact that you're suggesting that my farmers who may use genetically modified uh, organisms are, are doing something wrong. I, I've, I have farmers I represent who are on food stamps. They're not making a million dollars off of this thing. They do it because they love feeding people and they think they're doing something important to society. So I just want to say that. The, you know, the suggestion that they're doing something wrong is, is one I take exception to. Now my question is, the, uh, a number of you brought up, um, I guess there, there was some information during the California proposition that uh, the, the labeling would, would cost each household $1.27. Where did that number come from? That, I was going to brought that up. So the study uh, is in my testimony with a footnote. It's done by Emory University. I'm looking for the person's name. I'm, the whole footnote is in there. It's number number six. Okay, so it was an independent study yes. from Emory. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. I would note that about 98 percent of corn goes to feeding animals and goes to feeding our cars, and the same is true of soy. So those are about 90, 95 percent of all genetic engineered crops. About 96 to 98 percent goes to either either feeding cattle or feeding cars, not people, just as an addendum. Um, I just wanted to extend to you um, the opportunity to um, expand on that. Sure. Um, so I, I think um, Andy 
was getting at the same point I would make, which is that the way to get at this at this point when we talk about so much of the food has GMO ingredients in them, those ingredients are coming from a relatively small number of crops, right? Corn, soy, canola. So by focusing our efforts on that, that is the most efficient way to get this information out to consumers. We start with the big, you know, sugar, corn, uh, soy, canola, et cetera, those big crops. They end up in an enormous number of foods, but labeling that flow is the most efficient way to, to do it. And I think that was one of the points that Andy was making. I, the other, I know it's a hypothetical question. Um, we support the bill that's here as written, but we do have some experience in putting all of the emphasis on an absence label. And it's too long to get into, so I'll spare you the whole story, but there is a long battle over doing this in the world of uh, artificial dairy hormones for milk. And this is a nice talking point for the industry that we can rely on the marketplace to offer choices and we can rely on absence labels. But after the industry was able to shut down labeling for RBGH, which is very controversial, they didn't rest there. They then went down and tried to shut down absence labeling so that, that companies could not tell consumers they didn't use this controversial ingredient. So I understand the thought exercise. It's your job to have these debates. But we have been down that road and it has not worked for consumers. So I think we just really can't lose sight of that history, they don't let the marketplace transmit information unimpeded so we can make informed choices. They try to steer it in a way that serves the products they're trying to sell. And so this, we think that mandatory labeling of the users of this technology is the way to get the information to consumers. As a matter of fact, the labeling of milk without RGBH has to say this doesn't mean anything either way, right? Right. So there's a disclaimer, which is the result of... Right. Far too many legal rounds, I'll spare you the history of, but in many states, there were either bills in the legislature, I believe we got up to 10 states about five, six years ago, where there was either a bill in the legislature or a rulemaking at the state ag department that made it illegal to say it was f produced without RBGH. So that, that transaction of information, they attempted to shut it down so the market couldn't provide that information for folks looking for an alternative. We don't have any reason to trust that that wouldn't happen again. This is the same industry that was pushing RBGH is pushing, pushing GMO crops. And then there's the meta issue of like tracking who ate what. And affirmative labeling helps us know who ate what food since we're not tracking the health effects any other way. Now, I think that last point you made is very important and one that um, I guess we hadn't heard before this, this whole hearing, that uh, we cannot track the effects because it's not tested or told beforehand. And we need to track the effects. Um, I also see, you know, I come from the Upper West Side and part of uh, Hell's Kitchen, and there are plenty of RGBH labeled, non RGBH labeled milk products. So people are buying it. People want to know, you know, even though it might be more expensive for those or not, but they proudly say no RGBH, but the uh, disclaimer might give people who are not, uh, you know, intimately familiar with this whole um, idea some pause. I mean, it is contradicting sort of what it says. So the industry, I agree with you, the industry will stop nowhere um, at no point to get their mission accomplished. And, and we've seen that through the millions and millions of dollars that they've invested in lobbying. Can I ask you one last question? In, in your work in the past 15 years in other states, have you seen a trend toward more disclosure of information or, or not, and, and the public's um, demands? Yes, I mean, for those of us who've been working in food for two decades, it's very exciting to see the food movement growing, not just with organic and local, but also with the information that people really want to know. And uh, I, I think you know, this right to know is, I think, becoming a very powerful force in America. And the, the passage of the FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, I think was, was mentioned by the prior panel is great. Shows again that, that there's great concern there. I would note, however, that the, the Im import laws that just came in were only there as a result of my organization suing because they had not been done in a timely fashion. So that's under a court order. But it's still great to see that coming out. We have 25 states, as was mentioned earlier, uh, that now have labeling legislation. We saw the bills in Connecticut and Maine pass. Uh, and uh, narrow loss in California, but I think that you're seeing a growing movement. I think this is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I would also note that when states do this, I think it is inevitable that, that then it will become federal. People, I, people are making a contrast between, oh, I don't want it just state, I want it federal. 
I think the great way, if you want to get federal labeling, is to pass the state legislation, because then the feds are not going to be able to have like two or three different states. I think that will go to the federal legislation level. I think I made that point earlier. Um, I'm going to ask one final question, and then I'm going to ask the next panel to come up. Cons and it's a one-word answer. Consistent throughout the testimony uh, today of the opponents of the bill is that this legislation would place a cost, a burden, upon them. So my question to you is, and it's a yes or no, with no explanation other than yes or no, please, would this legislation place a burden upon the manufacturers? Yes or no? Or the food uh, industry? Or the supermarkets? Is it a, would it place a burden on them? Yes or no? And mind you, I support this legislation. I think it will, but I think it's a manageable. That's a yes or no, yes or no. Minimal is the one word, yeah. Okay, that is one word, okay. <laughs> Minimal. Minimal. Okay, so to translate that, the answer is yes. Thank you. Elval Giddings, doctor, that is, uh, Prometheus AB. Raise your hand, please. Do you swear that your testimony will be the truth? The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Excellent. Na uh, your name and affiliation, please. <clears throat> My name is Luther Val Giddings. I am an independent consultant. I am here at the request of the Biotechnology Industry Organization. Okay, and, and I'm not saying this specifically to you, but um, I noticed that your uh, material here is quite long, so please use your five minutes in any way you choose, but I would suggest you summarize it. Yes, sir. With your uh, permission, I'd like to submit my written testimony for the record. Yes, I'll, this will be part of the record. And I will summarize some of the salient points and uh, try and spare your time. You better, you better move the mic a little Is closer. this better? For them it is. For me it's not. Thank you for the feedback. Um, I do have some brief remarks I'd like to make to summarize my written testimony. But first, I'd like to put a few markers down, because there have been a number of statements made, a number of uh, assertions made uh, that, in fact, have not been factual. Uh, and I'd be delighted to discuss those, uh, if time permits. Uh, one has to do with the cost issue. Uh, one of the previous speakers suggested that countries around the world uh, that have imposed these labeling requirements uh, have not seen increases in their food costs. I have bought food in many of these countries around the world. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that even though I am not an economist, um, the countries that take their food labeling laws seriously and enforce the provisions of those labeling laws generally have food costs that are substantially and significantly higher than we see here in the United States. Food costs in, the, in Europe are significantly higher than they are here, so also in Japan and Korea. Uh, food costs in Kenya uh, and in Malaysia and in Indonesia uh, or Ukraine or uh, Kazakhstan uh, are not significantly higher, uh, but they don't enforce their labeling laws. The allegation was made uh, that uh, uh, independent researchers do not have access to seeds for these crops uh, to conduct independent uh, research on this. Uh, I would uh, suggest that you might want to consult with folks from the American Seed Trade Association who published in 2009 a statement of principles to which all their members, including the six companies that sell seeds for crops improved through biotechnology, uh, subscribe. Uh, and these seeds are, in fact, available to independent researchers, and much independent research has been done. I would refer you also to the Genera database on the Biofortified website which compiles a, uh, a collection of over 600 safety studies done on foods derived from crops improved through biotechnology and the crops themselves, uh, a significant portion of which, at least a third, if not half, uh, are independent academic studies not funded by scientists, uh, by scientists or, or associated with the industry. Uh, the allegation was made uh, from uh, uh, Member Rosenthal's comments, I think, that we've seen new allergies uh, uh, introduced through biotechnology. Uh, I'd be delighted to talk about that. The claim is incorrect. It is not, in fact, true. 
Uh, we've seen a reference to uh, the study that uh, Judy Carmen and some of her colleagues published recently claiming that uh, pigs fed biotech improved uh, crops, uh, animal feed, showed uh, elevated instances of inflammation in their digestive tract. Uh, this study is uh, uh, without merit. Uh, the criticism that came from it was not orchestrated by industry. Those of us who are independent scientists, in fact, were very upset that industry did not stand up to defend their products against the uh, unsupportable allegations made in the Carmen study. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about that in detail as well. Uh, but uh, to summarize my, my, uh, my written testimony, uh, proponents claim that uh, the bill before you is necessary to achieve two main objectives, one, to inform consumers, and two, to enable freedom of choice. But under existing FDA-mandated labeling standards, consumers already have access to abundant, accurate information about their food, uh, and they already have freedom to choose non-biotech foods through the USDA or organic label, private, uh, a number of different private certification schemes, and even smartphone, smartphone barcode apps. The real objective of proponents of this legislation, according to their own words, is in fact to mislead consumers about the safety of these products and to reduce freedom of choice while expanding market share for their preferred products. Uh, in their own words, I quote Joe Merkula, from Merkula.com, personally, I believe GM foods must be banned entirely, but labeling is the most efficient way to achieve this. Since 85% of the public will refuse to buy foods they know to be genetically modified, this will effectively eliminate them from the market, just the way it was done in Europe. Ronnie Cummins from the Organic Commun Consumers Association has said, the burning question for us all then becomes how and how quickly can we move healthy organic products from a 4.2% market niche to the dominating force to the dominant force in American food and farming. The first step is to change our labeling laws. Jeffrey Smith from the Institute of Responsible Technology has said, our goal was to generate a tipping point of consumer rejection in the US and Canada to eliminate GMOs from the marketplace. Andrew Kimbrell, from whom you just heard, uh, did not mention his previous statement that we are going to force them to label this food if we haven't labeled it, then we can organize people not to buy it. Now, even if the real objectives of the proponents of this legislation were laudable, the draft law as written is so poorly ordered it could not deliver on its objectives. It claims to focus on products of technologies that produce organisms modified in ways not found in nature, yet the technologies stigmatized are derived directly from phenomena scientists find everywhere in nature. The definitions are so inconsistent with scientific understanding it would capture a far broader swath of foods than those on which it claims to want to focus. The language of the bill is in fact so vague and confused it could not be implemented as written and would certainly invite legal challenges on multiple grounds. The legislation is based on numerous misunderstandings and contrafactual assertions. It ignores that crops and foods improved through biotechnology have been subjected to more scrutiny in advance, in depth and detail than any others in human history. And this is backed up by an abundant documentary record that is publicly available on the internet and in repositories around the country. It, the proponents rely on a handful of papers, mostly by anti-biotech activists like Judy Carmen, that have been severely criticized not only by scientists but by regulatory bodies for incompetent design, execution, and fatally flawed data analysis, rendering them useless, if not absolutely fraudulent. Proponents ignore the robust regulatory system in place at the federal level, as well as the mandatory FDA requirements that all foods sold in the U.S. be safe, that mandated label content be limited to information that is relevant to health, safety, and nutrition, and that labels must be accurate, informative, and not misleading. This label is designed to mislead. It ignores that existing labeling requirements would mandate a clear label for any bioengineered food with an altered material composition in any way relevant to health, safety, or nutrition. You heard a statement earlier today that if a gene encoding for a, an allergen was upregulated so that the allergen was present in higher concentrations in a food that FDA would not require a label for that, that's incorrect. It's false. FDA would most certainly require a label for that. Proponents also ignore that biotech foods have never been found to cause any negative health impacts in humans or animals, which contrasts dramatically with numerous deaths and illnesses from pathogens in foods produced through other methods. 
This bill seeks to solve a problem that does not exist and would have implemented. Gibbons, would you mind wrapping up, please? I'm, in the, I'm coming to the end. But I would note uh, well, that well, the first speaker had 45 minutes, uh, and it would take. No, 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 no. I have been very careful. Nobody's had more than five or six minutes all day. You entertain? Excuse me. Please I'm don't the, argue I'm about to it. Right I, now. I actually wrote down what time I called everybody and how long they had. The only time that anybody had more time was when they were responding to questions, but their statements were never more than five or six minutes, and I've been very careful about that because I'm kind of a stickler for that in case you haven't noticed. That's why we started this hearing exactly at 10 o'clock. So please conclude. I'm, I'm happy to wrap up. In closing, I'd like to leave you with some comments from the scientific bodies around the world. Uh, in particular, the European Commission uh, subsidized uh, a series of over 400 research projects by more than 80 research, um, independent research laboratories uh, in Europe uh, looking at issues related to the safety of crops and foods through biotechnology. And they concluded at the end that the main conclusion to be drawn from the efforts of more than 130 research projects covering a period of more than 25 years of research and involving more than 500 independent research groups is that biotechnology and in particular GMOs are no more risky than conventional plant breeding technologies. The American Medical Association, who was misquoted earlier, uh, has stated flat out there is no scientific justification for special labeling of genetically modified foods. The American Association for the Advancement of Science has stated the science is quite clear. Crop improvement by the modern molecular techniques of biotechnology is safe. Uh, and I have uh, similar representative quotes from a, a host of, of other uh, Well, they'll, they'll all be made part of the bodies. record. As I said, the written testimony is part of the record. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, the last witnesses who will come up together are nobody raised their hand. Are Scott Chasky and David Burns? Thank you. Uh, I should mention that we've been joined by another one of our colleagues who also sits on the committee, uh, Michaela Solage, on my left. Uh, raise your hands, please. Do you swear that your testimony will be the truth? I do. I do. Uh, please state your names and affiliations. My name is David Burns. My company is Good Boy Organics. Uh, I'm Scott Chasky, and I'm uh, speaking on behalf of NOFA New York, the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New York. I'm David Burns, President and Founder of Good Boy Organics, Chairman Dinowitz and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to give testimony in support of Assembly Bill A3525A. Uh, Chairman Dinowitz, you said all of you are capable of reading and to speak without reading my entire testimony, so I'd like to just try and address some of the things that we've heard here today. Um, first of all, uh, people get very, very, very passionate about food, food safety, and food security, as everyone has seen here today. Um, I, there's a part of me that would like to apologize on behalf of some of the people who are very vocal about GE labeling uh, to the Farm Bureau and, and to Mr. Rosen and to Mr. Finkel, and specifically to Mr. Ooms and Ms. Chittenden. I think very few people in this room have had the responsibility of stewarding a farm and may or may not understand the risks involved and uh, the amount of pressure to maintain something that their family has been building for generations. And uh, for those people, a lot of their information comes from people who are supplying them with seed. I don't know whether they have clarity in their decisions. That's their business, not mine. But I think they certainly have the ability to, to speak and be heard in what they want to say to this group. So just on to a couple other things, uh, just a few things I heard here today. Um, let's start with, uh, let's, let's, let's talk about GE labeling in general for the cost. I'm a food producer. We change labels all the time. It's regular. We change for things that are a market advantage, the color, a new font, a new ingredient, a better ingredient. It's a regular cost of doing business for us. Um, I saw also, or heard also, people were speaking about fresh fruits, and I don't recall who it was. Someone had spoken of having over 500 vegetables and fruits to track. There are only three, to my knowledge, that are genetically modified. 
So 497 are normal. That's just where they are. So there's some perhaps additional labeling, I believe, on some zucchinis, uh, crookneck squash, and papayas. I believe that's it. And I, I, I believe that's it for today. The other piece about tracking, people spoke as if tracking products from a, a field and a farm into a processing facility and out onto the shelf was an impossibility. The Food and Drug Administration and others have very specific rules about recalls. How can you identify a farm where E. coli came from if you don't have tracking methods already in place? We're subjected to these tracking methods every day. It's a normal part of how we do business. Um, ethnic products. I, I had never thought about ethnic products. It was actually a, a very interesting one to hear. The, the news for most folks is if you're interested in products from China, they already carry a label for GE, there would be no additional cost. If you're interested in products from Japan, they already carry a GE label, there'd be no additional cost. If you're buying from the EU, they already carry a label if they contain GE, there would be no additional cost. Uh, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the, what the issue is with ethnic foods. It actually seems like that's one that's almost insulated because the number of countries around the world that already label GE foods. Um, uh, label, uh, oh, food cost in Europe. Uh, I travel extensively in Europe. We actually bring a lot of the raw materials and finished goods that we work with from Europe for some very specific reasons. And uh, in terms of just costs of foods in Europe, uh, they have higher fuel costs, higher label costs, longer vacation days, uh, transportation issues are higher. Food costs in Europe generally from what I've seen are higher because the costs are higher. I haven't seen where GE labeling has been part of that. I haven't seen any study that says so, nor has any food producer in Europe said their costs are higher because of labeling. So I'm, I'm not sure where all of that comes from. Um, in no particular order, uh, Assemblymember Szymanowicz, I just wanted to point out to you that the rise in peanut allergies has been dramatic over the last 10, 15 years. Peanuts are grown primarily in rotation with cotton. The percentage of GMO cotton in the United States has gone through the roof in the last few years, and perhaps there's a link. I can't make that link. That's not why I'm here today. I'm really here just to address the cost of labeling. Uh, and let, let's go to <laughs> my family as a consumer. I've been in organic food and eaten organic food for close to 20 years. Um, it wasn't about GMOs because when I started eating organic, we didn't have widespread availability of GM crops. I started eating organic because I had questions about whether or not pesticides and herbicides were really safe for consumption. And I proceeded to take the awareness that I, I had learned through eating better food and I became a part of the organic food industry. I worked for a company in Nunday, New York called Once Again Nut Butter. This is one of the largest producers of organic nut butters and they're here in New York State. Um, I took that and went into my own business and created a, a, a group of products that we can identify as organic and non-GMO. But when my wife and I started to talk about health and nutrition, we felt very lucky, except in a few areas. We live in the Finger Lakes. We don't have the availability of organic. We have the desire to have it. We also uh, started to look around and we travel extensively. And when we travel, it's really tough because you, you find yourself in stores that you're unaccustomed to. And, uh, you know, you have to start to figure out, you know, your choices. And at the end of the day, our choice for my family is we would like to see a GE label. As a food producer, we don't feel it has higher costs. As a consumer in the state of New York, uh, we think it's critical to have that freedom for us to choose what we want to eat. This is a right to know issue, very simply. And we believe that in New York, we all have the right to know what's in our food. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Scott Chasky, and I'm a farmer. I work for a, uh, a land trust on the tip of Long Island, and um, uh, we specialize in land conservation, and we run a CSA farm, which we've been doing for 24 years. But I also was on the board of uh, NOFA New York, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, for about 12 years, and I was president for about five or six years. So I'm speaking for NOFA today. NOFA. Uh, for 30 years has been the leading organization in New York State working to promote organic and sustainable growing practices, educate and support organic farmers, and to grow the local food movement. NOFA New York has helped to support the tremendous growth of organic farms and organic farmland over these years. NOFA New York operates a United States Department of Agriculture USDA accredited certification program that certifies over 620 farms and food processors in New York State 
representing a minimum of $106 million in total gross organic sales in 2011. We remain the largest USDA-accredited organic certifier in New York, certifying over 60% of New York organic farms. We run an educational conf conference that attracts about 1,400 people, uh, and we have farmer consumer education program that includes technical assistance, education and outreach, state and federal policy advocacy, and general consumer education. Our members are very educated and concerned about GMOs. Currently, unless we eat only organic food, the only way to know you are eating GE-free food, each U.S. eater consumes our body weight in GE foods a year. People in New York State have no way of knowing whether the foods we buy are GE or contain GE ingredients because the FDA has chosen not to label GE foods. Arguments against GE labeling center around the ability of U.S. goods to compete in a global market. We've heard this many times today, but considering that 64 countries already have GE labeling laws, including all of the EU and China, this argument doesn't make much sense. Another argument is that most foods contain ingredients that are derived from GE corn, soy, or canola, so everything would need to be labeled, and thus the label would be meaningless. If all of our food products need a GE label, how is that something we don't need to know? Could it be that the companies that produce GE seed are afraid that a label on everything in the grocery store will cause consumers to demand change? Another argument advanced against labeling is that corporations like Monsanto will sue state governments and losing these suits will be very costly for the government and taxpayers. The Environmental and Natural Resource Law Clinic at Vermont Law School did a thorough analysis of potential constitutional issues with GE labeling laws and concluded that states can pass defensible legislation. They also put together seven binders with collections of articles and research on GE safety, religious objections, legal issues, etc., and these are available freely. Since the introduction of GE crops in the late 1990s, diet-related illnesses have increased dramatically. That is not proof that processed foods containing GE ingredients, mainly corn and soy, are to blame. But what is astonishing is that no solid long-term studies have been done in this country to investigate it. Although there is currently no evidence that eating GE food has caused human ill health, this lack of scientific evidence, no evidence of harm, is not the same as positive evidence of no harm. The defenders of GE use the lack of scientific evidence to make the false claim that no one has come to any harm from eating GE food. Anecdotal stories from U.S., Danish, and Indian farmers persist and are mounting, claiming that GE feed has led to health and reproductive problems in livestock. A recent study shows increased inflammation in the stomachs of U.S. pigs fed to GE diet. At a minimum, this deserves an independent and thorough investigation. So I'd like to mention... Uh, Two, um, there are actually two studies uh, done fairly recently, one by Earth Open Source, which is about a 130-page document, which was done by scientists in, in Britain. And so the thing, thing that's often used is, is that, that the side asking for labeling, etc., is anti-science. But GE is, is put up as the ultimate science. However, I, I, I've been writing a book about seeds for the last two years, and um, almost all that I read notes that the technology is, in fact, I, I, the word I, I've, I've found recently is <coughs> the technology is actually clunky, that GE technology is, is put up as the highest science possible, but in fact, um, there's there's lots of, lots of questions to ask about this. Okay, the other so the Earth Open Source the study is, I'd like to mention the other one is the Nature Institute and both of these are uh, organizations which are run by scientists. Okay, I'll finish up here. Um, while studies of GE foods are lacking, there have been many studies of Roundup and its main ingredient glyphosate. The herbicide that is applied to most GE crops. Well, during the first three years of commercialization using Roundup Ready, GE seeds did reduce the use of herbicides. Since 1999, herbicide use has risen annually, reaching over 159 million pounds last year. Glyphosate is implicated as a threat to animal health 
ecological diversity and has been found in the bloodstream of unborn babies. Studies show that glyphosate attacks some of the beneficial organisms in the human digestive system. Glyph glyphosate also causes health problems in humans, including increased incidence of birth defects, miscarriages, infertility, cancers, DNA damage, which can lead to cancer and birth defects, and neurological development problems in children, kidney failure, respiratory problems, and allergies. And by now, everyone in North America may have glyphosate in our systems due to the enormous usage of this herbicide on GE crops. Um, we've passed um, resolutions over a number of years, and those are listed, so um, I probably don't have time to read those, but they're there. Uh, okay, I'll finish. NOFA New York members, both farmers and consumers, feel strongly that GE crops create environmental risks, perhaps irreversible, present com consumer health concerns that have not fully been researched, and put the integrity of the organic market at risk jeopardizing the organic farmer's right to farm. In the words of organic farmer Jody Beloit of Roxbury Farm, Columbia County, a GE label is just the beginning, but a very necessary step to a more sustainable and just food system. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs> um, the, uh, the bill will come before the Consumer Affairs Committee next year in the legislative session. That's my intention. And I want to thank all of the people here who came to testify today. Uh, I think your input, your statements on one side or another really are very helpful to all of us. Uh, as you can see, some of the committee members uh, want to learn more, have an open mind about this, and uh, there are committee members who are not here today, and I'm sure they're going to uh, read the testimony that was given as well as the testimony that was submitted. So um, all of your input really is extremely helpful. And I thank you all for being here. And I just want to thank my colleagues, uh, and including our sponsor of the bill, uh, Assembly Member Linda Rosenthal, and all the members of the Consumer Affairs Committee. And I also want to thank Lehman College. Now that we had a hearing at Lehman College, I can't see ever going down to the bottom of Manhattan to hold another assembly hearing again. So thank you, Lehman College. Have a good afternoon.